Hello, and welcome to the Not a Cast podcast, the one true chapter by chapter podcast going through a song of ice and fire one chapter a week. I am one of your hosts, Jeff, better known as Brenna B. Fish. And I'm your other host, Emmett, better known as Poor Quentin. And welcome to the 122nd episode of the Not a Cast titled Songs and Screams, an analysis of a Clash of Kings Catlin 6, in which Edmure Tully fights and wins the Battle of the Fords against that fucking war criminal Tywin Lannister. So then why does Catelyn Stark feel so afraid? I'm going to go with indigestion. <laughs> Nothing more serious than that it could possibly be plaguing the Starks. <laughs> oh, no, no, no sense of foreboding or their ultimate tragic downfall at all in the no. works in this chapter whatsoever. Mm-mm, she picked a crab out of the wrong part of the river. That's all this is. Yeah, don't eat mud crabs, Catelyn. Just don't eat. Just get, <laughs> get it from the sea from here on going forward. So, as always, this episode is brought to you by our not a small council. A change to our our name for our highest uh, tier on Patreon. Our hand of the king, Wolfman Zach, Grand Maester Tim Bob, Troubleshooters of Systems, and Designer of Circuit Boards. Lord Commander of the King's Guard, Mark N. Lord Travis, Master of Ships and War of the Waves. Captain of the War Galley Nightwolf, the ship that stalks the seven seas and weeder of the Valyrian Steel's trident summoner, the blade that brings the Deep Ones. Sir Keith J, Master of Whispers. Lord Philip the Merciful, Master of Lords. Archbaster Jum, Healer of the Lesser Poxes. Ragged Michael, Ward of the North. Nelson Hammer, Prince of Dragonscone. Scarlet, the other a woman and Mistress of Whispers. Lord Micah, the Quilled Lion, War of the West, Herald the Golden Tooth, Master of the Bane Fort, and the Kraken's Bane. Lord James, the gym that was promised, the High Bearded Priest. Lord Jake Assistant, to the Hand of the King, Lady Zena Valyrian, Sir Jack, Lord of Sir Arthur Dane, and Prince Rhaegar Targaryen's Sad Prophecy Boys Club. His Gracious High Inquisitor, Sir Frank B. Sir Jasper the Cruel, the King's Justice. Lawrence, Prince of Dorne. Kelly, Warren the Beast and Mistress of Old Bay of Crabs. Steve the Steadfast, Master of Hounds. Blue Winter Rose, Knight of Highgarden, Lady Stephanie, Lord Adamus, Lord Carlos, Lord Andrew the Restless, a Priest of the Drowned God, the King's Cook, Noli Oli, Master of Cannoli, Sir Source of Delica, Prince Matthew of House Targaryen, Prince Matthew of House Targaryen, Proud Soy Boy of Summer Hall, Defender of the Fifth Book, and Swing Dancer with Dragons, the artist formerly known as Sir K.W. Den, Elsie the Blackwood Guard, and Batman of the Seven Kingdoms has now directed that he shall henceforth be known as Low Energy Dent, Master of the Bane. <laughs> Master of the Bane Fort, Master of Coin. Lord Jean, the true Master of Coin, believes this to be treason. Lord Micah, the true Master of the Bane Fort, has declared that Dent better relent. Lord Pension for Nostalgia. Queer Ele- Alex. <laughs> this is great. Queer Alex, Rainbow Commander of the Ladies and Gentle Dems. Lord Quint Esquire, Master of Absolutely Positively, not serving as a spy for several unnamed high lords and ladies in order to further the secret Black Fire style conspiracy to overthrow the oppressive small council. Haldover, the waiter for T. Wow. A. A. Ron, Dampere, Prophet of the Forsaken, and the High Priest of Euron Crozai. Lieutenant Glenn, Lord of H Town. Veneris of House Colgarian, the First for Dame, Princess of Dragonstone, Mistress of Art, the Overworked, Queen of the Pencils, the Eraser in the First Draft, Queen of Monochrome, Devotee the Great, Game of Thrones, Portress of the Realm, Lady Reels of the Seven Kings, Blender of Paints, and Maker of Drawings. Shamal the Slayer, Lord Adam T, Lady Alexander of Tarth, Sir Christoph Logos, Bloody Scorpion, the Red Field, Defender of the Letter of Kin, and the Wolverine of House Corgoyle. Lady Elizabeth, Mistress of Horse Face Lesbians, Sir Josh Snow, Bastard Bounty Hunter of the North, Surveyor, Chief of Parties of the Frozen Wastes, Lord Peter, Lady Ashley, the Dead Shepherd Reborn, Preacher of the Poor Fellows, Marshall, Harrison, still absent, still shepherd, in, still in the Jade Sea, Grave, Rob Stark, the Cadaver King and Horror of Heron Hall, Olaf, proponent of establishing a feudal pseudo democratic system of great councils wherein every count votes, Sir Tim, the Knight Who is Guided by Voices, Lord Nick, Thucydides, Lord of Plagues, Sir Jack, Lord of Sir Arthur Dane, and Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, Sad Prophecy Boys Club, Lord Jean the Splendid, Master of Coin, Warden of Tampa Bay, Lady Anna, the Lovey Castellan, Pat Ironwood, the Blood Royal and Guardian of the Bone Way, Lord Charles Tyrell of High Garden, Lord Paramount of the Bander, Defender of the Marches, High Marshal of the Reach, War of the South, and the Heir of House Tyrell, Luke, Lord of Lone Leaf and the Pillar of Autumn, and our two newest slash oldest returning small council members. Just Reds on Twitter, otherwise known as Squid Pro Quo, and the Master of Zorse. Thank you to our counselors very much, and welcome back, Reds and Master of Zorse. Thank you, as always, to our counselors, and a special welcome back, of course, to Just Reds and Master of Zorse. So happy to have you back with us. Mm-hmm. And our spoiler warning, as we say in all episodes, we'll potentially be talking about all published books. That is the five novels, three Duncan Egg novellas, histories, interviews, the Winsome Winter Sample Chapters, as well as Game of Thrones, a TV show. Anything and everything. Our question this week comes from Luke, Lord of Lonely, from the Pillar of Autumn, one of our small council patrons, who asks, Last week there was a breakdown of Stannis saying to Davos, I do not require your understanding, only your service. 
The objections to this line were myriad, but one huge aspect of it came from Stannis' failure to ask only for service that would bring Davos no honor, as Cat pledges to do for Brienne. How does Stannis' sentiment here compare to Rob's when he returns from the West and admonishes Edmure for not realizing and executing on Rob's plan to bait Tywin West? I know we will definitely talk about this when we get to A Storm of Swords, but I think the comparison here is useful. Is Stannis' reluctance and personal struggle to give a dishonorable order before he ultimately gives it to Davos anyway? Any worse or better than Rob not even realizing he was asking Edmure to do this, do the dishonorable in the first place? Uh, that's a great question. What do you think, Jeff? Do, do you think uh, Rob was breaking that line of not asking for dishonorable service when he left Edmure at River Run? So this is going to be something that we're going to have a major debate on when we get to A Storm of Swords, Catelyn 2, right? That's the chapter where Brendan and, and Rob return back home. And then they end up just tongue lashing Edmure for like the last third of the chapter, uh, which is both great and horrifying for me as an Edmure fan, but also a lover of a good tongue lashing. Um, but to, to talk about it broadly, uh, without getting into the specifics, because the specifics will be for that debate. I, I do think it's it's a great question because I think it, it does speak to something that we're seeing a lot among these noble characters in Westeros and that they share traits. In this case, the shared trait is that Stannis is making explicit what most lords make implicit and they saying like, I'm not asking for your understanding. I just do what I fucking tell you to do. That's what you hear from a person like Stannis Baratheon who is known for his bluntness and his honesty at some level, but something you don't hear from those who are a little more urbane and sophisticated and and, and don't say sure, things sure. like you know just like fucking listen to me and do what i say like rob stark will be like hold river run and not really explain much more beyond that um he's it, rob stark is asking for edmure's obedience in the matter but it's it's a little interesting in that he doesn't get very explicit on the order which has of course led to this massive fan debate which has raged now for when I wanted a storm of swords published 2000 so 20 years at this point about whether Edmure was in the wrong or whether Rob was in the wrong there I do think too like the, the Stannis's reluctance and personal struggle struggle about giving a dishonorable order I, yeah it is actually a, a bit worse than Rob not realizing he was asking Edmure to do something dishonorable in the first place because Rob wasn't actually asking Edmure to do something dishonorable by simply holding River Run. Now, you could talk about the morality and ethics behind the order and whether it was better for Edmure to explicitly disobey the order given that Tywin would commit a host of war crimes on the way out west. But I don't think it's a dishonorable order at all. I think it's just, it feels like an ethical order in the in the uniform Westeros code of military justice, ultimately, it would be a just order that was given by a superior officer to Edmure Tully, albeit a bit vague, as we'll talk about in you know about a year or so. What do you think, sir? I think that's a fair distinction. <coughs> I think there's definitely a case to be made. Rob should have clued Edmure in more into what was happening, but I don't think he really asked dishonorable service of Edmure, just like incomplete and dissatisfying service of Edmure. I think that's more a political problem than kind of, I think, uh, the, the real ethical struggle going on between Stannis and Davos. And yeah, Stannis is certainly more blunt about how the system works, but uh, you know, I, don't, I, I, I hesitate to see he's being more honest in this moment because he's, what he's really saying is, I don't have to be honest with you, Davos. I yeah. don't have to explain myself to you. So it, it's an interesting kind of thing where he's being honest about his dishonesty, which gets at the complexity of Stannis' character, but also I think it kind of the, the, the tortured position he's put himself in. And with Rob and Edmure, it's a little different in part just because we don't we don't really see this order being given because George is, I think by the time he gets to Storm, George, now this, this, this is just kind of not necessarily the the most smoothly written part of the series, the way Edmure seems to be exceeding his orders without realizing it and Rob's orders weren't very clear. So this happens off screen. So it, it, it's not, it doesn't, for me, resonate quite as much the same as like an ethical struggle for a character and more a a, a plot device that Rob and Edmure respond to in, in kind of different ways. But, you know, as, as Jeff says, we'll have a, a kind of deeper debate on on exactly what Rob did and why he did it when we get to a storm of swords. Because one of you know one of the features of a Clash of Kings is that Rob is not here at all. George has said he's lamented that, but for the moment we got to work without Rob Stark. Right, and I think like you talked about this about this in terms of Jamie, but you had talked about him being a structuring absence. So that Rob works sure. the same exact way in the mm -hmm. story, being that structuring absence, and so that so much of what we know about what Rob said or did not say to Ed Tully before he left for the Westerlands is intentionally sur it's intentionally vague and unclear because you know Catelyn Stark was down in the Stormlands when Rob actually departed for uh, for mm -hmm. the Westerlands and so just having that ability to not know information leads to a great and interesting dynamic come a storm of swords and also one that of course dominates fan discussion to this very day in the year of 2020 of our lord and will on and on and on god, <laughs> god willing you know so, George actually talked about that one time oh sorry go ahead 
Well, we'll, okay. well I'll, we no, okay. we'll talk about that when we get to no. In, in a storm of swords, when we get to talk to that, George actually someone said like, "Was this who was actually at fault here?" And George actually responded, "But I'm not gonna." Um, we'll save that that, that, that little nugget for for <laughs> storm of swords. So thank you, Luke, for the question. If you'd like to ask us questions, we answer here on the Not a Cast podcast. You are welcome to become a sworn sword or higher level patron over at patreoncom slash a a s o i a f where you can also find show notes, access to the Nata Slack at our two highest tiers, Fever Dream episodes, and a Song of Ice and Fire bonus episodes, like our recently released third part of The Second Coming, our five-part analysis of the Winds of Winter chapter The Forsaken for all poor fellow and above patrons. Yeah, that was a really good episode. So, hope you guys who are patrons are enjoying that. And if you're not a patron yet, feel free to check it out. And we also just announced a brand new stretch goal on Patreon. That is, if we get up to 1,250 total patrons, I know that seems like an exact number, and it is, or increase up to $7,500 a month, we are going to do something that we've been asked. I mean, Emmett, you, we've how many hundreds of people it's not hundreds it's probably a dozen people at most but really how many thousands of people millions of people have asked us to do this one thing since the start of the podcast that one thing that they all want us to do on patreon and that is namely a likely absolutely multi-part series on the first novella of george r, r. martin's duncan egg series the hedge knight so if that or any of the other benefits interests you please head on over to patreon.com forward slash not a cast a s o i a f but enough about Patreon. When we last checked in with Catelyn Stark, who has done nothing, three things, four things, five things wrong, she had arrived back at River Run to find Ed Telling preparing for battle against Tywin Lannister. Thank you, Jeff, and I'll take over from there. <laughs> yes, yes, do it, yes. Let's find out what happens with said battle in this synopsis of A Clash of Kings, Catelyn Six. Tell father I have gone to make him proud. With those dramatic words echoing in his own head, Edmure Tilly swings up into the saddle and prepares to set out for battle. Catelyn tells Edmure that their dad was always proud of him and loves him fiercely. Your father loves you, Faramir, and will remember it ere the end. Oh, sorry, wrong story. Edmure says he means, means to give Hoster better reason to be proud of him than mere birth. Oh, Edmure, why do you do this to yourself, buddy? The host sets out, all things shining. Catelyn thinks to herself that she has a greater host than Edmure's, a host of doubts and fears. Next to Catelyn, Brienne's misery is palpable. You get the idea. Everyone is just depressed in this chapter. <laughs> Brienne has rejected the conventional garments Catelyn had custom made for her, preferring her warrior's garb as she patrols the walls of as she patrols the walls of River Run, along with those few men Edmure left behind to hold the castle under the command of Sir Desmond de Grell. When the army of the River Lords is gone, Brienne asks Catelyn what they should do now. Catelyn responds that they should do their duty. She always did, as she thinks to herself. She'd had to play the role of son and daughter both to their father, and then take on the duties of Lady of River Run after her mother died. She'd been prepared to marry Brandon Stark. She did marry his brother Ned. She bore this stranger's son as he went off to war, because she always did her duty. Poetic stuff. Compelling and rich, per Angerman. Catelyn visits the Sept and lights candles to the warrior, praying that both Edmure and Rob stay safe during their respective campaigns. The new Septon is an earnest young man, unfamiliar to Catelyn, who can't help but long for old Septon Osmond. She would have felt comfortable confiding her fears about Stannis and the Shadow in him. Alas, all the old guard are gone, dead or dying. They always seem to, to know everything, and Catelyn feels she knows nothing, Jon Snow. Catelyn finds herself wondering whether the old gods might offer her more comfort these days. Outside, Catelyn and Brienne stop to watch local singing sensation Rymond the Rhymer entertain the small folk. He is singing about Lord Derriman's brave stand at the Bloody Meadow. A bunch of snotty little brats run around hitting each other with sticks. Catelyn wonders why children are such violent monsters and suspects that the gilded romanticism of Rymond's songs is the ultimate explanation. Brienne says she can't stand the waiting. At least battle allows you to release your tension and you don't feel so helpless with arms and armor. Catelyn reminds Brienne of the fatal dangers in battle. Brienne counters that women die in childbirth and Rymond isn't singing about them. Catelyn compares childbirth and parenting to a fierce, painful battle of sorts. She assumes that Brienne's mother has taught her all this, but Brienne never knew her mother. Swing and Selwyn Tarth had a different dance partner every year, but they didn't teach Brienne anything and PTA conservative Catelyn does not prove. 
Catelyn wishes she was omnipresent so she could protect all five of her children at once as they've scattered across a continent convulsing in war. Brienne wonders who would keep Catelyn herself safe in such a scenario. Catelyn responds with a weary smile that the men around her are supposed to take care of that, but since they're not, Brienne will have to do. Maester Vyman brings Catelyn a letter from Lord Meadows, the new castellan of Storm's End, since the mysterious, untimely demise of Sir Courtney Penrose. Stannis Baratheon has taken Storm's End, and the garrison has entered his service. Catelyn tells the maester to send word to Rob, and then reviews the situation with Brienne. Catelyn concludes that Stannis needed Edric Storm to compare his looks to Joffrey, in order to bolster his case that Joffrey is not Robert's son. Catelyn doesn't think it'll do any good, though, lol. And anyway, this train of thought just winds up making her obsess about another bastard, Jon Snow. Who was his mother? Guess we'll never know. Speaking of bastards and letters, they'd also received a message from Bruce Bolton confirming that he was marching on Harrenhal to play his part in Edmure's plan. He will take the castle if he has to kill everyone inside to make it so. Yikes, nice guy. <laughs> he also says he's glad Sir Roderick executed Ramsay, a tainted monster who would have only threatened Bruce's trueborn children. You, uh... You don't know how right you are on that one, Roos. But enough of these character dynamics and important plot groundwork. Let's get to the battle. Sir Desmond's squire comes bursting into Catelyn's room to tell her that men flying the purple unicorn of House Brax are threatening the nearest ford. Catelyn stops long enough to ponder if their commander might be the same Brax to whom she was almost betrothed back in the day, and then dashes up to the walls. Lord Desmond informs her that the enemy rode out of the southeast, but that they are outriders and Tywin's main force remains well to the south. Catelyn can see the nearest ford, held by Lord Jason Malister, and the Braxmen preparing to cross, no more than 50 of them. They spread out into a line, charge across the river, Brienne mutters, now, and all hell breaks loose. Catelyn isn't quite close enough to make out the details. She hears screams, steel on steel, and finally watches a corpse sail down river. The Braxmen regroup and retreat the way they came. Sir Desmond wishes Lord Hoster had been able to watch and take heart. Catelyn counters that Hoster's dancing days are done, and that Tywin still greatly outnumbers Edmure. Desmond points out that Edmure has geography on his side. The West Bank is higher than the East, and there is plenty of cover for his archers. Moreover, his best knights remain in reserve, ready to throw back any Lannister forces that manage to secure a foothold on the other side. Catelyn hopes that Desmond is right. The battle resumes at midnight. A serving girl wakes Catelyn, who climbs up to the roof. The Lannister men try to cross under cover of darkness, hoping the defenders would be blind, forgetting they can't see in the dark either. <laughs> the Malister archers take down a bunch of them with fire arrows, oddly beautiful, against the night sky. As they return to their rooms, Catelyn asks Brienne for her thoughts on the unfolding conflict. Brienne says that so far, they have just seen a brush of Tywin's fingertip as he looks for a weak spot along the fords. If he doesn't find one, he will gather all his strength together, all those fingers into a fist to make one. Or at least, that's what Brienne would do. The next day, Catelyn sends the steward Utherides Wayne with a flagon of wine to Cleos Frey to loosen his tongue for questioning. While she waits for Cleos to get wasted, Catelyn hears news of more attempted crossings deflected by the River Lords and starts thinking that her fears about Edmure's plan were misplaced. Oh boy, savor that optimistic spirit while you can, Cat. Catelyn waits until nightfall before visiting Cleos so he'll be as drunk as possible. And indeed, when she gets there, Coleos is stumbling around and slurring his words like your average Ohio sports ball fan. Did they do that right, Jeff? I know mocking Ohio is your thing. I'm new at this. Yeah, it's great. That's perfect. Good, just, good. A plus. Just Beginner's that. luck. Cleos protests that he had no idea Tyrion planned on using his escort to break Jamie out. And Catelyn reassures him that she knows no fray would break an oath. Unless it suited them, of course. Uh, that probably won't pay off at all. Sob. Catelyn commands Cleos to tell her about the terms Tyrion offered, and he does so. And Catelyn thinks to herself that Edmure was right, and these were no terms at all. There is, however, one part of Tyrion's counteroffer that intrigues her. Bannister will exchange Arya and Sansa for his brother. Yes, he sat on the Iron Throne and swore it. Before witnesses? Before all the courts, my lady, and the gods as well. I said as much to Sir Edmure, but he told me that it was not possible, that his grace Rob would never consent. He told you true. Cat can't even say that Rob would be wrong on this count. Jamie is dangerous, and Arya and Sansa are, well, children. She then asks if Cleos saw her daughters while at court. He stumbles over his words. Catelyn realizes that Cleos is trying to lie, but is too drunk to be good at it. 
She threatens his life and asks again. Cleos, now with a cold sweat, responds with the truth. He saw Sansa, who looked a bit drawn, understatement of the year there. He did not see Arya. Catelyn thinks to herself that Cersei might have been keeping Arya locked away, lest she embarrass the Lannisters in public. Or Arya might be dead. Oh, Catelyn, wrong on both counts. Catelyn shoves these painful thoughts away and gets back to business. Why was Tyrion offering terms when Cersei is the queen regent? Cleos says that Cersei was indisposed. Again, quite the understatement. <laughs> Catelyn thinks back to her time spent with Tyrion, trekking through the Mountains of the Moon. He'd managed to get Bronn on his side. He's so clever that Catelyn isn't even surprised that he somehow survived the high road and made it back to King's Landing to serve his hand. He came to her defense when the clansmen attacked, and he had nothing to do with Ned's execution. According to Littlefinger, who would never lie to her, Tyrion was the one who sent that dagger to slit her son's throat. But he denied it again and again in the Vale. Catelyn can't bear this uncertainty and declares that Tyrion lied, like how all Lannisters lie. Cleos blinks, like that one gif, and says he doesn't know what she's talking about. Catelyn agrees that you know nothing, Cleos Snow, and leaves with Brienne. Catelyn wishes that her life could be simpler, like a man, like Brienne's, with no agonizing decisions. Hmm, you sure about that one, Catelyn? Well, I guess Brienne's big choices come later. Ryman's the rhymer entertains them during supper with his number one hit, Wolf in the Night, about Rob's victory at the Battle of Oxcross. Everyone wolf howls along, especially Desmond Grell, who's even more wasted than Cleos. Catelyn doesn't join in, but hopes the songs make them brave. Brienne mentions that there were always singers in her father's hall when she was growing up. She memorized all the songs. Catelyn recalled that Sansa was the same way, though few singers braved the journey to Winterfell. Catelyn had promised her daughter that not only singers, but a life out of the songs waited for her in King's Landing. Will the gods forgive Catelyn for unknowingly trapping her daughter? Sad stuff. Brienne remembers one singer specifically who came from over the narrow sea. Her waist was tiny. She was the anti-Brienne, basically. Catelyn asks if Brienne ever sang for her father or for Renly, but Brienne gets embarrassed. Catelyn hopes that Brienne will one day sing for her. Brienne demurs and asks to leave the table. Catelyn grants her leave. Several days later, they hear that Brienne had the right of it. Having failed to find a weak spot, Tywin tried to force one. And he failed. Catelyn knows the news is good just from the look on the messenger's face. Lord Lefford drowned, Strong Boar was taken captive, Adam Marbrand was turned back three times, and even when Gregor managed to secure a crossing, it was only temporary before Edmure's reserve forced him to retreat. Tywin is now retreating to the southeast, Edmure writes. A faint, perhaps, or full retreat, it matters not. They shall not cross. Oh, Edmure, oh, buddy. Oh, no. Desmond Grell is overjoyed, wishing only that he'd been there, and he immediately starts thinking up lyrics for the song about the battle to be commissioned from Ryman to the Rhymer. Catelyn still isn't in the singing mood, but she allows everyone to celebrate Edmure's victory by getting drunk. Are you noticing a theme in this chapter? Everyone spends the whole thing drunk. As the rest of the castle parties through the night, Catelyn consults her father's maps. As she notes... If Tywin is marching southeast from River Run, he's probably reached the headwaters of the Blackwater by now. She feels profoundly uneasy and can't say why. After all, they keep winning battle after battle. So why does she feel so afraid? Mm. And that is A Clash of Kings, Catelyn Six, a great battle chapter and an even better chapter in terms of characterization and prose. What did you think of this chapter, sir? First off, like you did back when we did the Battle of the Green Fork for Tyrion's eighth chapter. Just amazing read and synopsis, sir. Well, thank you, sir. Just Somehow you, up to your standards. Well, you you bring like this literary brilliance and humor to the synopsis gotcha. that I can only attempt at when I'm like uh when I when I'm a little bit when I'm like uh, an IPA and a half deep into, into my cups. So, <laughs> that to speak. so that's that's all it really requires for me to start thinking that I'm a uh, I'm as smart as you, which I'm not. <laughs> it's just really cool. Give me so. a fucking break. <laughs> it's it's really, really Quiet. so all the same, just in all seriousness, really well done. Again, more of this. I think we're going to do more of this when we come to the Battle of the Blackwater, which is just a uh, just a few months away at this point. Um, so hell yeah, too. hell yeah. So uh, my opening thought is: Is Catelyn the best battle point of view chapter in all of A Song of Ice and Fire? I mean, okay, yeah, I love Davos at the Blackwater, John at the Wall, Barristan at the Battle of Fire, at least in the two released Winds of Winter chapters. But Catelyn brings such a unique perspective to 
battle. I mean, she's not a war fighter or anything. She's an observer, always watching as though she loves goes out to fight. Now, I, I think it's good that George also shows us the shit, blood, and dying on the battlefield, too. It's just that Catelyn provides pathos when the heat of battle provides adventure and horror, both at the same level. Both perspectives, I think, are important in understanding warfare, but Catelyn's and also Sansa Stark's perspective come the Battle of Blackwater are unique, and A Song of Ice and Fire is so much better for having these unique perspectives on warfare. I agree. You know, this is just uh, another great chapter from the best POV in the book. This chapter, I think, is the sequel to A Game of Thrones, Catelyn 10. That one was about the Battle of the Whispering Wood, and this one is about the Battle of the Fords. Both are battle scenes fought at a distance in moonlight, with Catelyn pondering mournfully on the nature of life and death and the unknowable fates that have brought her here. It's all very poetic and full of memorable imagery in both cases. The difference is that Catelyn is less isolated at River Run than she was at the Whispering Wood. This chapter doesn't unfold purely in Catelyn's thoughts, rather it depicts the struggle to reconcile those thoughts with the other characters and outside world pushing in, complicating her worldview. We haven't taken the full plunge into darkness that is Catelyn's last and best chapter in the book, but night is falling, and the last sparks of literal and figurative light in Catelyn 6 do not comfort her by the end. Right. I mean, here we were talking about this in the pre-episode, but this is very much where Catelyn's story starts to ratchet forward into kind of the tragic aspect of the Stark story overall, at least in the first three books of the story. So to kind of start out, the framing of this chapter is one we're intimately familiar with and one that resonates throughout the story over and over again. Edmure tells Catelyn, tell father I have gone to make him proud. So Edmir is riding out against Tywin Lannister and fighting a battle against Lannister invaders. Fucking war, atrocity, criminals, all of them all deserve to be put on trial. But Ed, he accept, but Edmir rides out desperately seeking the love from his father and acceptance. Just be proud of me, Dad. Of note, Edmir himself did not make the trip up to Hoster's bedside to say a possible final goodbye to Dad. He leaves that to Catelyn. Please go tell my dad that I just, I'm going out to make him proud. And Edmure's relationship with Hoster, as we talked about in Catelyn 5, never reads as an especially close one. In Catelyn 5, we learn that Hoster seemed to invest much of his teaching and experience in Catelyn as Edmure was born late. So Edmure had been a classic rich boy fuck-up party animal, and now he means to give Hoster a better reason to love his son than sharing the same surname. But Big Daddy Hoster is on his deathbed, and Edmure doesn't want to be around the stink of death, as Catelyn thinks. So death seemingly unnerves Catelyn. So then why is he out here on the march against Tywin? Edmure's framing device to achieve his father's love and acceptance is through a traditional noble Westerosi setting, namely war. War was an Iron Man's proper trade according to Theon Greyjoy. But let's not get ourselves here into thinking that this doesn't define the existence of the noble classes of Westeros as a whole, especially the male aspects of the, of the noble classes of Westeros. Edmure has a sir in front of his name, and, and future he'll have a lord in front of his name. The title that acknowledges his training as a knight and page and squire before that, and his ultimately it's his training on how to actually kill. Hoster was a renowned warrior too, serving in the War of the Nine Penny Kings and fighting in Robert's Rebellion. And unlike some of his more, call it morality, curious noblemen, Hoster was quite bloody in that conflict in the Robert's Rebellion, burning the village of Lord Goodbrook in order to secure his allegiance. And to kind of dip a little bit into Karl Marx, I think as a friend of yours, um, <laughs> war sustains the stratified economic hierarchy with Edmure and Catelyn's ancestors clawing their way into power through violence or the threat of violence. This same power paradigm allows Edmure to keep his lands, title, and future lordship. But to then come from the opposite, from the right side of the spectrum, from Marx, namely through a character by the name of Murray Rothbard, war is how the state feeds itself. That strong war horse, shining armor, and flowing banner, well, they weren't just donated by the small folk in order to help Edmure in his quest for glory. They were paid for by the iron price, or the threat thereof. You make very good points. When I critique Edmure's eagerness for war... I don't mean to suggest that this is happening in isolation, that he's coming up with bloodthirstiness on his own. Rather, he is responding to the institutional incentives of leadership in this world. And not just in this world, but our world, as your citations indicate. You know, Oliver Stone's movie JFK wandered too far into the boomer <laughs> conspiracy weeds for many people. But putting these specifics aside, I think he, he did a good job at illustrating how power works in general with the line everyone likes to quote. The organizing principle of any society is for war. 
The authority of the state over its people rests in its war powers. Edmure has commissioned this unnecessary battle from George in order to demonstrate to his peers that he can perform this kind of leadership, which is very important to them. If he doesn't do this, it's entirely possible that they will respect him less than they did Hoster and House Tully will lose its authority. Now look, I would certainly prefer a Riverlands in which the fencing off of the commons is reversed, in which the people are free to work the land and barter with one another without putting up with armed landlords. But the fall of House Tully wouldn't necessarily produce such an environment on its own. More likely, as we see play out post-Red Wedding, is that another pack of armed landlords, namely the Freys, would take over. And the Freys are definitely worse stewards of the land and people than the Tullys. So I don't mean to suggest that Edmure is like single-handedly preventing a better world from being born. He's not. Rather, I would argue that he is a good man raised in a bad system. As you say, he is struggling to, to reconcile his personal and political values, to make the man he is and the man he's supposed to be line up. Edmure's need to perform lordship, that shadow on a wall, for his peers is inextricable from his deep-seated need to live up to his father's image specifically. As I said last time we checked in with Catalan, the subtext here is that Edmure resents how his big sister was raised as the heir, not him. Edmure has always doubted his own ability to fill his father's big shoes, so now he is desperately overcompensating to the ruin of his own faction. He's got the armor, the horse, the army. He looks every inch the Lord, as George puts it, for the first time. And by doing all of this, he can finally make his father proud of him by demonstrating that Edmure can be like Hoster. And such is the hole inside Edmure Tully. And that's heartbreaking because the love of a parent for a child ought to be unconditional. That's what Catalan tells Edmure. Hoster was always proud of you and he loved you. You're his son after all. But Edmure means to give Hoster better reason than mere birth, as he says. He will love me for my actions, not merely my existence. <laughs> Again, it's heartbreaking. Edmure feels unloved and worse, he feels that he doesn't deserve love, not yet. Only by playing his public role will he earn private intimacy and self-worth. And there are so many levels of irony in terms of how this plays out. Mere birth is the only reason Edmure is in command of this army in the first place. The only reason he is heir to this castle and all that goes with it. Even as Edmure strives for a better world, he is locked within this world's values and viewpoints and so is always denied the peace he seeks. Moreover, Hoster is too far gone to change his opinion of Edmure, or indeed recognize Edmure. Only the image remains to torment his children as they try to live up to it. Edmure is just too late. And if Hoster was more cogent, Edmure wouldn't be in command of anything to begin with. Edmure is, is the classic child caught inside the adult man. And finally, given how the Battle of Fords ends up screwing over House Tully in the big picture, Hoster probably would have ended up ashamed of Edmure, if anything, if he was mentally aware enough to know what had happened. And in the end, after Hoster dies, Edmure bursts into tears and drowns his grief in booze because he just, he never managed to cross this bridge, this metaphorical bridge where Tywin is trying to cross this literal river. Edmure never managed to cross it. Hmm, that's so poetic, man. I, I, I love that. And I think it, it is absolutely true that Edmure is consistently seeking to gain the love and acceptance of a father figure, and not just, not just a father figure, but a father who can't really reciprocate that love toward his son, given his physical ailments at this point in the story, but also too, because Hoster might not have even been capable of reciprocating that love to Edmure, given how much he had given to Catelyn and how much he had like with, <laughs> withheld from, from Lysa, namely. But regardless, the war is coming to the Riverlands. And as much as we look askance at the way everyone, Edmure, the Tullys, the Lannisters, Westeros got here historically, Edmure and the worst goons of Westeros, excuse me, Tywin and the worst goons of Westeros are on their way. So Edmure and his army ride out, banners streaming in the wind, calling attention to how George tries to tease out both sides of the war. As he said in an interview with uh, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation in 2012, I think if you're going to write about war and violence, then show the cost. Show how ugly it is. Show both sides of it. There's also the other side, which sometimes gets me in trouble with the opposite side of the spectrum, the glory of war. Those of us who are opposed to war tend to try to pretend it doesn't exist. But if you read the ancient historical sources, people are always talking about the banners that stirred the heart. I think that if you're going to write about that period, then you should reflect honestly what it's about and capture both sides of it. 
And I think also too, as Edmure is riding out from River Run, it should call it back to our mind the end of a Game of Thrones brand six, in which Rob Stark rode out from Winterfell to the cheering of the crowds, but then the cheering grows quieter and quieter and quieter the farther Rob progresses forward. Left behind from that scene was Brand the Broken, Maester Lewin, and those deemed not important enough to take part in the in Rob's war. And that same dynamic is occurring here at River Run. I think you nailed it. George uses his his gorgeous imagery and his prose to make us feel that glory you were talking about. The excitement in Edmure's stomach as he rides off with his banners. And it's it's important because if we don't understand that emotion, we're going to be left with the conclusion that the appeal of war is limited to bloodthirsty sadists. And while I understand the self-righteous appeal of that mindset, it's just not <laughs> accurate. And so it, it's an incomplete perspective that is going to leave us wrong-footed. It will prevent us from understanding how war happens if we think that way. Rather than denying us the glory of that image, which is what a lot of true grimdark does, George asks us to reconcile the image and what lies beneath it, those two sides he was talking about. How is it that the shining, powerful Lord of Riverrun can be a scared, flawed man-child? who believes he cannot live up to the very imagery he is politically exploiting. And as you say, George also uses the distinct POV of Catalan, as he did with Bran, to inform our understanding. We are not riding off to war under those banners, like the characters from the songs and stories. We are watching the banners dwindle in the distance, left behind in their wake, picking up the pieces. And it's great. I think that's a really one of the reasons why I just did um adore Catelyn's perspective on these battles and why I think she might be the best point of view uh, for these types of battles because we do get that other sense of war from behind the battle lines, from behind the actual line of shields and spears moving forward. We get the perspective of someone who's watching it all with fear and dread because as Edmure rides off, he is leaving two miserable, sad women behind him in River Run. These women, namely Catelyn and Brienne, feel the way they do because of the societal constraints placed around them due to their status as women. Catelyn feels doubt and fear. She calls them a host for the battle ahead. But there's premonition that something else is coming, something worse. What could that be? Oh, okay, I got to read Brand, Brand's sixth chapter in A Clash of Kings to find that out. Meanwhile, Brienne is miserable because the promise of riding to battle as a knight of summer has been denied to her yet again. Similar to what happened at Storm's End, Brienne has been ordered to stay behind. She can't go out to fight this time. She has to uh, stay behind at Riverrun because they uh, need her to be in the garrison, just like Renly needed her to dress her for battle, but not actually to ride out in the vanguard along with the shiny Knights of Summer. But this time, though, it's not the two-faced Renly who publicly extols her virtue while privately calling her absurd to let... Uh, while privately calling her absurd. This time, it's the gentry of the Riverlands, though still being quite polite, same as they were in Catelyn 5. They still place Brienne in the strictures which they feel comfortable with. Like Storm's End, Brienne has been tasked with assisting the garrison of Riverrun and holding the castle if the river crossings are breached by the Lannisters. So the women stay in the castle with all the quote-unquote useless mouths that Catelyn talked about in Catelyn, in Catelyn 5 and that Edmure has crammed into the castle. It, it burdens my conscience to point out that despite Catelyn being always good, almost always the time, this is the spot where Catelyn's aristocratic upbringing and status as daughter of Hostetella gives her a sadly short-sighted view. These might be, quote-unquote, useless mouths in the short term, and that they will eat at the food stores that the Tellys have laid aside at River Run. In the long term, though, aren't these the citizens of the Riverlands who will provide the labor that produces new food that needs to be grown for everyone to eat so no one starves to death come winter, come the next war? Eh, whatever. Moreover, this blind spot for Catelyn is one that shouldn't be given. Moreover, this blind spot for Catelyn is one that shouldn't be given that the start that she shouldn't necessarily have because the Starks have traditionally kept a winter town for all the quote unquote useless mouths during winter time. And Catelyn should be aware of this as she's seen at least one winter in the north right before Bran was born and seen how the best feudal arrangements in Westeros works. As Lewin says in the very next chapter, Bran's sixth chapter, a lord must protect his small folk. It's an interesting comparison. And, it, you know, it's a slippery game to deduce what is conventional wisdom being expressed and what are character-specific blind spots. As in real life, there is no clear-cut way to make that distinction as the two are always informing each other. On one hand, Catelyn is clearly filtering everything Edmure does through this perspective of he's my fuck up little brother. If someone else had made this movie, if Hoster had decided to do this, maybe Catelyn would think more kindly of it. On the other, Catelyn is reflecting how the Riverlands as a whole, while believing strongly in Guestright, 
except for the phrase, doesn't have the same communitarian history as the North in part because of climate differences and in part because of the White Walkers, which of course seem to go hand in hand. And those two have made the North care much more about keeping everyone inside and keeping them safe. Catelyn has seen a different model at Winterfell, but she hasn't necessarily internalized it because it was her sons who were truly educated in it, not her. The Tullys just haven't been in charge of the Riverlands for very long. The history here is riven with internal contradictions and endless feuds rather than kind of one model to either cleave to or from. You know, David Lannister uses the same phrase, useless mouths, to describe everyone the Blackfish kicks out of River Run after the Red Wedding. John repeatedly uses the same phrase to describe the Wildling civilians, and he's sympathetic to them, and he was raised as a Stark. As things get worse in Westeros, it brings the best out in some, the worst out in others, and with most people, it does both at the same time. Hard times breed hard choices, and while I absolutely come down with Edmure here, Adeline, as usual, reflects the conventional wisdom of her class, and she honestly believes that her actions reflect a sense of duty. That plays out in an interesting way with Brienne. Catelyn had a bunch of gowns sewn for her because of course she did. <laughs> that is a pure Catelyn move. On the one hand, it's well-intentioned and you can see how badly Catelyn is missing her daughters that she's trying her best to mother Brienne. On the other, this is salt in Brienne's wounds given her relationship to the performance of femininity. Catelyn has known her long enough to know that. Catelyn is making Brienne less comfortable, not more, because Ridley Catelyn is servicing her own comfort. She wants to look at Brienne and see her in a gown so she, Catelyn, feels better. It's an unthinking selfishness under surface generosity. But this dynamic is then rendered moot by the needs of the war. Brienne is required on the walls because all the most capable men are leaving. We see this in the real world too, with the most familiar example for Americans being women allowed into more jobs during World War II, and that's setting the foundation for certain advancements later on. But Brienne still isn't satisfied by this because she'd rather be off with Edmure and that was really never on the table. Such complex dynamics here. Hmm. We are seeing a step forward collide with multiple different kinds of steps back and no individual is really satisfied with the outcome of this. How are Catelyn and Brienne supposed to conduct themselves in such a scenario? Right, and Brienne, Brienne specifically asks what they should do and Catelyn having already fulfilled the family portion of her family's motto says it's time to do some duty. But even as Catelyn says this, she starts to question this entire concept of duty that she's lived her life for. What exactly has she gained from performing duty her entire life? As we've been saying for every Catelyn chapter since the Game of Thrones, a lot of her arc tends to revolve around discovering that the norms that kept her safe, they don't really exist anymore. And we get the clearest statement of how she's performed her duty in the past in this just phenomenal quote. I gave Brandon my favor to wear and never comforted, comforted Peter once after he was wounded, nor bid him farewell when father sent him off. And when Brandon was murdered and, and father told me I must wed his brother, I did so gladly, though I never saw Ned's face until our wedding day. I gave my maiden head to this solemn stranger and sent him off to his war and his king and the woman who bore him his bastard, because I always did my duty. I just feel those pathos there. I think you guys should feel those pathos as well and see what quote unquote doing her duty has brought to Catelyn. This is one of the key passages in Catelyn's story. And like many of those key passages for her, it is a sorrowful reckoning with the weight of time. What Edmure fears, Catelyn confirms, if only in her thoughts. Hoster always loved her best. Why? Because she always did her duty. As I said, when Catelyn faced down her chalk outlined gods down in the Stormlands, doing her duty has involved constantly changing the mask she wears. She had to be a son to Hoster at first, as well as daughter. Then she had to be the Lady of River Run. Then she had to be Brandon's bride. Then she suddenly had to be Ned's, a parent to this solemn stranger's child. Edmure has been staring down a single identity, Lord of River Run, his entire life. But Catelyn's own crisis is of a different nature. Her identity is splintered, hence her line about wanting to be divided so as to protect all her children. There is no one clear place for her to be. She has expected to carry out an iron constant, her duty, even as the nature of that duty changed, even as the role she had to play changed. And this is a sentiment that Jamie will bring to the surface in Catelyn's next chapter that the demands of duty are not only onerous, they are unfair or even absurd. Catelyn has not only had to run a gauntlet, she's had to run multiple contradictory gauntlets, each seeking to erase the previous one. Her mirror is a broken one. Mm. 
Hmm. And the cracks are rapidly growing as we go. Catalan does not describe being conflicted in these moments in her past. There is no doubt, no tears in these flashbacks. She knew her duty and did it. She is nostalgic for these moments that seemed so clear, decision points that made her who she was. She is trying to take comfort in them now, but it's not working. The nostalgia is giving way to despair. These keystone memories are not giving her fresh strength. They're not allaying her host of doubts and fears, as she puts it. Why is that? I think there are several factors at work. One is just what Catelyn has been experiencing recently. Everything from Brand's fall, to the attack on him in his bed, to Ned's execution, to the shadow baby attack. All of that is weighing on her, replacing even the wistful dream of what could have been from her second chapter in this book with dread, a growing certainty of doom. Another factor is that her duty in this case requires her to sit still and chafe while Edmure executes a plan she hates to fill his own hole inside. She's as miserable being left out of this as Brienne. Not that Catelyn wants to directly engage in combat like Brienne, but she wants to be involved. She wants some, some catharsis, something to lay her hands on. And that gets into the major factor at work in Catelyn's depressive summary of her life. She knows what it all was leading to now, and that just alienates her from everything. She can't recognize it. It's all withered beyond repair. It was all in service to Hoster's needs, she seems to realize now, and now Hoster is beyond her help. As a young woman in these moments, she was looking forward to the future. Looking back now, she sees that every step of the way, her journey was marked by death and pain. Her brothers died in the cradle, and so she had to be Hoster's son. Even when her mother brought forth a living son, she died in the process, and so Catelyn had to switch right over into being Lady of Riverrun. She was going to be Brandon's bride, but then he died. So she became Ned's and he rode off to war and some other woman. Becoming the woman she is was a process of grieving, of constantly having to let go of not just other people, but the lives she had to live for them, the people she was for them. Death, AKA winter, has come again and again, taking part of Catelyn away each time. And I took part gladly. I gave Brandon my favor over Peter. I burned the letter from him unread. I saved my virginity for Ned. What Catelyn feels looking back is what so many people feel looking back at the major moments of their youth. I don't even feel like the same person. I don't even remember consciously making those decisions. I just did. Catelyn feels now like duty has acted through her, not the other way around. It's a sense of alienation from one's own life. Catelyn has been acting out a script, she realizes, and now it's only blank pages and she's improvising. Mm. This internal monologue is thus kin to the Knights of Summer monologue from her second chapter in this book. A reckoning with what the sweep of time has done to youthful ideals. I lived my life for duty and now I find I don't even know what it is. And not knowing what that duty is forces her to back to a familiar way of resolving that blankness that ambiguity because catelyn returns to a familiar source of comfort faith so she goes to the sept to pray which should i think kind of put us back into our mindset from catelyn's fourth chapter in the clash of kings where she goes to this small sept in the abandoned village outside of storm's end to pray just before the aborted battle of storm's end in catelyn's fourth chapter she saw the face of those she knew in the gods but here, it's kind of interesting. She barely lights a candle to the warrior and prays for the souls of the future slain. And for victory, too. She's praying that the gods are telepartisans here, after all. In similar fashion to Storm's End, Catelyn is consumed with doubt and wishes for answers, as you were talking about. But the answers she wants won't come from the gods. Rather, she desires answers from authority figures to tell her what to do when she has no idea what to actually do. Catelyn wonders maybe what answers the old gods might offer, which speaks both to her religious background and also her love for Ned, but also that just extraordinary sense of longing for answers and truth and knowledge and obje objectivity that she just does not feel whatsoever in this moment. She's no longer feeling it in the faith of her fathers, the faith in which she was raised. And a lot of that, a lot of that has to do with the divides of the civil war. As you say, the sense that are these gods going to, you know, have favorites? Are they going to be partisans? We just saw Tyrion praying to the seven in King's Landing. So whose prayers are going to be answered? Which side will the warrior favor? He's got these different candles. As Jamie himself will say about knighthood, it's too much. Whatever the gods do, they're forsaking one side or the other. 
no one winds up saved. Catelyn only wishes she had the Septon of her childhood back to help her explain things, because she doesn't know this earnest young new one. This is less an accurate reflection on the two Septons and more another reckoning with the subjective Doppler effect nature of memory and time. The old Septon would probably be just as baffled by the shadow binding as the new one. He would likely have little more to offer regarding the rest of Catelyn's woes than just the comfort of listening to her. Why would that comfort work for Catelyn, whereas comfort from the new Septon wouldn't? Because of her nostalgia for the way things used to be. That's what she wants to feel again. Not the gods in themselves, but the security she felt back in the days when the gods made sense to her. Hoster is gone. Her memories of duty are behind her, and that they can all be replaced so easily, like this new Septon has her spooked. What was all that for? Right. And the fact that the Septon could be replaced too, I think it speaks to another aspect of A Song of Ice and Fire, namely that we are seeing the epoch of the older generation giving way to the new generation. Catelyn is giving way to Sansa and Arya, Rob sort of, and Bran and other, and Rickon too. But when Catelyn gets outside, she hears a different type of singing than the one that was found at the Sept. This time it's singing and it's rhyming. Toby the rhymer belting out the words to courtesy of the silver, red, and blue. <laughs> No, what he actually sings is about some Lord Daramon Derry, who's only mentioned in all the Song of Ice and Fire. Look this up. It's actually in this chapter. We don't know anything else about this guy except for what the song that he sings. Catelyn then observes some boys hitting each other with sticks and wonders if Ryman's song and other like-minded songs encourage boys to be warlike and violent. And as someone who is definitely not influenced by stirring music, Band of Brothers imagery on recruiting posters in like 2001, absolutely not. This is not something that I felt whatsoever. But I am also reminded of a scene from Sebastian Younger's 2010 book, War, which I ironically read while I was in Afghanistan, in which one of the soldiers interviewed recounts that his mom banned him from owning toy guns. So this guy would then take bites out of graham crackers and fashion them into guns and play with guns that way. Maybe there's something intrinsic to us that desires violence and war. I don't know. The song that Ryman sings is interesting it's one part death metal ballad and one part azora high reborn imagery with the red sword of heroes glowing red with the with the setting sun of course the blade is also red with all the blood that this lord Derry uh, allegedly shed and the sword is hungry for more blood and i do kind of wonder whether this is a potential allusion to valyrian steel and the blood magic that goes into the process of creating such metal I wonder if it might be. This might be George, you know, questioning the the foundations of those those shining steel swords that everyone longs for, and the Azor High architect that everyone longs to be. The foundation for it is blood. And yeah, this is my favorite part of the chapter. One of those perfect passages in A Song of Ice and Fire that seems to so beautifully summarize the whole. Catelyn spends her story in the heart of the war, trying and failing to save her family from the fire. And here she asks, well, why is it like this in the first place? Now, of course, Catelyn's answer is not a bunch of warlords invented a self-serving definition of property, fenced off the commons, got obscenely rich off of it, and have been playing at war ever since to the ruin of all. That is my answer, and I think if you, you know, gave George truth serum and pressed him beyond his precious ambiguities, he would say something similar. <laughs> but Catelyn doesn't have that perspective. In any way, she's getting at something different than the material historical causes of the conflict. What she's getting at is the heart of what A Song of Ice and Fire is about. Stories give our lives meaning, yet they are not an accurate reflection of those lives. Human beings, in their lived experience, are inchoate masses of contradictory thoughts and emotions, confined to a present moment we can never truly inhabit. We are smart enough to realize that there's something more to our lives than eating, shitting, and dying, but not smart enough to know innately what that is. We dwell on stories, songs, narratives, myths, not as diversions, but because these are our only tools for truly understanding ourselves. And I say this not as a rejection of scientific understanding, but as acknowledgement that even scientific understanding comes filtered to our brains through narrative. It's humanity's number one tool. Is it biology? that makes us turn on one another, the competitive dictates of evolution at work, the fallen nature of man since we forsook paradise? Perhaps. <laughs> but what George suggests here via Catalan and Ryman's The Rhymer is that we are not born violent. We are made so by our stories. Nurture, not nature, makes us who we are. The culture Catalan has been immersed in part of her whole life. That is what makes us this way. 
I can't tell you how many post 9-11 recruitment ads I saw growing up that made joining the Marines look like you were basically going to go fight one of the Balrogs from Lord <laughs> of the Rings. Those ads played on our innate love of narrative, not just bloodthirst, not just bigotry, although that's certainly part of it. It played on our obsession with building tension and catharsis, our framework for understanding life. That's why it's appealing. And just like with the songs of Rhyme and the Rhymer, it all comes down to blood. Is this a bitter confession on George's part that he feels like his artwork, his creativity, his singing like Rhyme and the Rhymer is just kind of caught up in this horrible half mm. evolution, half culture machine? You know, I often find myself thinking about filmmaker Francois Truffaut's dictum that it's impossible to make an actual anti-war movie. That the very act of framing war with a narrative arc makes it exciting and therefore appealing. It's impossible to convey the destruction of war thusly because that destruction is anti-narrative by its very nature. And I can point to counterexamples like anyone else. I just rewatched this, this brutal 80s uh, Soviet movie called Come and See about hmm. the Eastern Front that is, is just, I, re I recommend it, it's a brilliant movie, but it's, it's just really hard to watch about the atrocities there. You know, obviously the opening scene of Saving Private Ryan would not make anyone want to enlist in isolation. But the very act of stirring our emotions, which which filmmakers, you know, feel they must do, runs counter to the idea of critiquing war, which is by nature about unstirring our bellicosity. George's faith in storytelling animates so much of A Song of Ice and Fire, but he reflects his own doubts through Catalans here by exposing the limits of stories, how they can always be corrupted in service of violence and power. I think that's a, that's a really good point. And I think too, some of the, I think it was Lewis who mentioned it in the chat about how sometimes it's really, we get kind of stirred up by the, the, the scenes from Game of Thrones, the show where you have the Stark banner flying over some place or whatnot. We end up being feeling compelled and called to serve underneath of that banner, right? So I, I think you're, you're, you're pointing out something that's tough to kind of kind of reconcile with George's stated in desire to write a, a more, not a total, but a more anti-war story than what you would find normally in this type of, of, of genre. But with all of that in background, Brienne finally gets around to voicing her own misery. She hates waiting around. She could be fighting and she feels helpless. Besides that, she would be well protected and unlikely to be hurt with a suit of armor on, which should, of course, give us a standard and pause when we think about how Stannis and all of his armor knights defeated a hundred thousand wildlings with relative ease at the Battle of the Wall towards the end of A Storm of Swords. Anyhow, this drives the conversation towards Brienne and Catelyn talking about gender roles and norms in Westeros. Brienne, interestingly, talks about the birthing bed as a battlefield, kind of continuing on a line of thought that she started with Catelyn in Catelyn's fifth chapter, talking about Catelyn's specific role as a mother. And Catelyn agrees with Brienne's assessment of it being a battlefield, but it's an unglorious type of battlefield. No battles, no, no banners or war horns involved. The struggles of women, specifically the domestic struggles of women, are so often left out of the stories and songs. And so they come to seem unglamorous, unremarkable, even though they involve pain and perseverance, just like survival on the battlefield. Brienne does seem to have a genuine taste for swordplay. But I have to wonder whether she embraced this knight persona in part because she desperately wanted to be part of the songs and this was just the only way. No banners would wave, no war horns would blow for the Lady of Tarth giving birth to and raising the children of her husband, the protagonist. Yet even when she arrived at Renly's camp, seemingly the heart of the songs, she was left out, ostracized, treated as if she didn't belong there. Catelyn, meanwhile, was raised as Hoster's heir but then replaced by Edmure. She has to stand on the periphery and watch him fail. But as I keep saying, Catelyn is the avatar of conventional wisdom in Westeros, so she doesn't look at her gender role as a cage. She believes, for the most part, in the gender roles of Westeros. I know that because of what she says to Brienne about her father's paramours, that those were no ladies. <laughs> Brienne lacked a mother to raise her with the understanding Catelyn is trying to communicate, that women fight their battles by raising children. That's where our energy goes. Instead, the only women Brienne had around were Selwyn's lovers, and in Catelyn's conventional wisdom, oh, they don't count as proper women. <laughs> they wouldn't have anything to teach Brienne about motherhood, about the pain of childbirth, about the struggles of being a noble lady in Westeros. Catelyn feels like she's being pulled in five directions at once. Her duty demands she look after all her children, but that's impossible right now. She would give her life to keep them all safe. But then Brienne asks who would keep Catelyn safe? which is where it all falls apart. Catelyn says her mother, a proper lady, unlike the women in Brienne's life, 
told her the men in her family would keep her safe. Her father, her uncle, her brother, her lord husband, they protect her while she protects the kids. That's how this society is supposed to work. The system in which Catelyn believes. A series of overlapping protections, everyone keeping each other safe. That's how it works in the lessons Catelyn was taught, the stories she read, and the songs she sang. But that's not how it works in the waking world. Catelyn's husband is dead, her father is dying, and her uncle and her brother are off unknowingly screwing up each other's battle plans. Catelyn is alone, bereft and grieving, forsaken even by her gods. So Catelyn's conservative insistence that those were no ladies looks so silly in context. Oh, those women failed to live up to the societal norms, the very societal norms that have now abandoned you? Perish the thought. <laughs> The definition of a lady by which Catelyn operates is founded on society working like it's supposed to, and it clearly doesn't. So of what use was this, this petty kind of mean snobbish distinction? The shadow on a wall is fading, faltering, and at some level Catelyn knows it. That's why her smile is so drawn and tired, almost ironic as she explains <laughs> her worldview to Brienne. It's a mantra, a projection, an image, nothing more. Catelyn is losing the thread that connects this worldview to reality. The Red Wedding will cut that thread for good, the culminating break after all these early tremors. Mm, that is so well said, and I absolutely agree. I think this is the spot where Catelyn is learning that the worldview that she has been holding dear her entire life is falling to pieces, and it just shatters by the time we get to the Red Wedding. Right after that moment where Brienne and Catelyn are talking, a letter comes from Storm's End, and this is where... George starts to do a little bit of complicating uh, for the events that occurred from Davos' second chapter in Clash of Kings. Because the letter comes from a Lord Meadows, the new Castellan of Storm's End, and he reveals that the castle has surrendered to Stannis. And Stannis has let everyone but Gordy Penrose live? Wait, that's not right. <laughs> I could have sworn I heard Stannis say, I give you fair warning. If you force me to take my castle by storm, you may expect no mercy. I will hang you for traitors, every one of you. Instead, Stannis has spared everyone but Courtney Penrose, and they're now all Stannis loyalists. Go, Stannis! I guess Stannis sort of had it out from executing the garrison in that he did not have to storm the castle, but still, points to Stannis for not murdering the bejesus <laughs> out of everyone at Storm's End. Go, job, Stannis! <laughs> right on his forehead. I like the gold star and go, gold star! <laughs> Absolutely. And then the discussion then turns to an omission letter, no mention of Edric Storm. So why did Stannis want him so badly? After a little bit of back and forth, it finally dawns on Catelyn that Stannis wanted Edric because the boy looks like Robert while Joffrey doesn't. So this kind of brings us back to a point we've been talking about since Davos' first chapter in A Clash of Kings. Stannis doesn't explain why he does most of the things he does, and this leaves people to assume the very worst about Stannis' motivations and objectives. Of course, the great thing about A Song of Ice and Fire is that these mentions of Edric Storm work as a pseudo hand wave of the plot away, which helps set up the core of the second half of Davos' arc in The Storm of Swords. But that idea about Joffrey and Edric looking nothing like would not be proof to any of the Lannisters who were supporting Joffrey on the Iron Throne. Besides, most of Catelyn's children had the Tully look as opposed to Ned Stark's look. But John didn't. John had Ned's look. And Catelyn doesn't know if John's mother prayed for John with the same fervency as Catelyn prays for her own kids. Maybe she was dead, especially if the mom was a Shara Dame. And this is interestingly, as opposed to the show, which does ha has a scene between with Catelyn where she's talking about Jon Snow. This is as close as we're ever going to get to Catelyn feeling something besides dread, fear, and hatred regarding Jon Snow. We're seeing a lot in this chapter that Catelyn is being forced to probe into uncertain waters and she really doesn't like it. And she keeps kind of snapping back to certainties and the things she knows. Like when she's talking to Cleos about the Lannisters and starts wondering if she can trust them and she just doesn't want to think about that. And if, if Peter Baelish lied to her, I, I can't really think about that. Hmm. And here she's being forced to confront the limits of her own knowledge and empathy. She doesn't know who John's mother was, what she might be feeling. She feels a tinge of empathy for Ashara or whomever John's mother might be, <laughs> just as she did for Cersei and her children. Remember that in the Sept of Storms mm -hmm. in when she's thinking, oh, Cersei brought them forth, they're her kids. She felt them inside her, just like I felt mine inside of me. Catelyn wants things to be black and white, not because she's inherently like a, a simplistic mean person, but because she wants something to quell her terror. <laughs> Instead though, she just keeps finding shades of gray. Even with bastards, everyone treats their bastards differently. Ned was fiercely protective of John, as she said. Courtney Payne, 
Courtney Penrose laid down his life to protect Edric, who wasn't even his child. But uh, not everyone is so kind and humanitarian on the subject of the baseborn, unfortunately. Yeah, there's this other character by the name of Roose Bolton, who, of course, Catling receives a letter from. And this, uh, thinking about John, forces her to think about that letter that Roose Bolton sent to her because uh, he doesn't treat his bastard with um, anything resembling what Ned treated his bastard and what Ed, and what Edric and what Courtney Penrose did with with Edric Storm, because. Bruce Bolton's response is really, really strange to his son's death. Bruce Bolton writes a letter basically shrugging off Ramsey's death and saying that it's probably better that Ramsey is dead. Of course, it's specifically better for Bruce Bolton for two major reasons. The first being the one that he says in the letter, that Ramsey would be a threat to his own children. No fucking shit. The second reason is that a dead Ramsey keeps anyone from finding out that he was the one who likely ordered Ramsey to take Lady Hornwood and marry her by force to advance Bolton power in the North. However, I think it's important and a little uncomfortable to note that Roos's cold and queer letter it kind of sounds an awful like the way another character will talk about a bastard's threat to Trueborn's sons in a storm of swords. Remember this quote? I know you trust John, but can you trust his sons or their sons? The Blackfire pretenders troubled the Targaryens for five generations until Barris and the Bold slew the last of them on the stepstones. If you make John legitimate, there is no way to turn him bastard again. Should he wed and breed any sons you may have by Jane will never be safe. That person who said that quote, Albert Einstein. No, it's Catelyn Stark. Catelyn does not rise anywhere close to the kind of cold psychopathy that is Roose Bolton in totality, but she is still the product of the same class prejudices against bastards. But then news arrives, and it's the war shit, baby. Take us away, sir. Tell us all about the battle. I know you were sitting so patiently through the, the melancholia, <laughs> the, the Rhaegar Targaryen-esque talk of all these emotions. So tell us what is up with the Battle of the Fords. Oh, uh, yes. It is time for me to stretch out here. Let me get a little bit loose. All right, here we go. To kind of set this battle up properly, I think it's important to talk about the background plot-wise and character-wise to why the Tullys and Lancers are about to fight here at the Fords. And we did talk about the placement of forces back in Catelyn 5, noting where Tywin, Rob, Edmure, and Bruce Bolton all were. We also talked about Edmure's plan of trapping Tywin's army between the uh, between Edmure's army on the rivers, Bruce Bolton's army at Harrenhal, and the Tyrells to the south. We did say, we did give Edmure a little bit of credit, or at least, uh, we did give Edmure a little bit of credit that it was a bit of a cunning plan. Here, though, let's laser focus instead of all those things on Edmure, his history, and his temperament as a commander. So Edmure has a giant chip on his shoulder as he rides out from River Run. The last time the Lashes came galloping towards River Run, Jamie walloped him and took him prisoner. He was only freed at the Battle of the Camps due to the very smart plan of his nephew Rob Stark and his uncle Brendan Tully. Now, Edmure feels like he has to prove himself with this battle. He's already started off wanting to make his dad proud, but he has to make a victory as splendid as the ones that Rob has been winning out in the West. So while the underlying plan Edmure is embarking upon is relatively decent, we do have to admit that he's operating pretty emotionally at this point. But let's talk about the plan now that we've set the table accordingly. The basic outline of this plan looks like a standard strong point defensive plan, i.e. key defensive points which anchor the overall defense network and structure along a line. In this case, the strong points are the areas of the river where the water is shallow enough to allow a crossing, aka ford, hence, aka the Battle of the Fords. Talking a little bit about Okoka, which everyone, everyone knows is an acronym that means observation and fields of fire, cover and concealment, obstacles, man-made and natural, key or defensive terrain, average approach, we do see some sense behind Edmure's plan. So Desmond Grell points out that the west bank of the Red Fork is higher than the east bank, which gives advantage to the Tullys. Additionally, the west bank is wooded and able to provide cover and concealment for the defenders. Finally, Desmond mentions that there are clear fields of fire for their archers, which indicates to me that the trees are a bit kind of spaced out and archers can duck out of cover, release a few arrows and duck back into cover quickly. Edmure's purpose of using these tactics is to mitigate the disparity between the Riverland numbers and Lancer numbers. As Catelyn pointed out back in Catelyn 5, that Tywin has more soldiers than Edmure does, perhaps twice as many soldiers. Strong points then allow Edmure to mass his smaller army in key spots and also to force the Lancers to constrict themselves into smaller formations to cross the river or risk being swept away by the rushing river or swept under by deeper water. From what we can tell from this chapter, from what we can tell from this chapter, Edmure has tasked his subordinate commanders with blocking the Lancers to keep them on the east bank of the river in order to prevent them from gaining the western bank of the river. Task and purpose. To accomplish this, his plan revolves around the use of ranged weapons, archers, and scorpions to break up any advance into the river itself. Additionally, the Tullys have planted caltrops, i.e., sharp little metal balls. I actually, looked at a picture about this. It's a little 
gnarly. Um, that, that work as an area denial weapon and would cause men and horses to step on them and get stabbed through their fucking feet. Ouch. Fucking ouch. If ranged weapons and booby traps did not prevent Lancer men from making it to the Western Bank, Tully Knights would then gallop down on the Westermen before they could properly form for battle. Turning to the Lancer plan, boo, from what we could tell, Tywin's plan seemingly is about fourfold. Probe for weak points, assess the intelligence collected during these probes, mass and force, and attack and force at a spot judged weakest. Because I'm extremely, extremely fair to Tywin Lannister here on the Not A Cast podcast, I should point out that Tywin is at a disadvantage in attacking at all. It's a not a sure thing for him to actually win here or succeed despite his numbers. Tywin's army doesn't know the land as well as the Riverlanders do, and without having any soldiers on the west bank of the Red Fork, they don't know the disposition of the Riverlander army. So Tywin attempts to develop the intelligence picture with multiple probes at various crossings. The first one occurs near River Run with 50 Brack soldiers attempting a daytime crossing mounted. Catelyn and Brienne directly observe this crossing and watch as these Westermen are gallantly killed and driven back across the river. They then, the Braxmen, then try, try again at night, thinking that the Tully night fires will make the defenders night blind. And I'm a little perplexed as to why they kept attempting to push across this particular ford, given the reception the last time, and given that their objective was to actually probe for the defensive line on the Tully position. Tywin is only supposed to be probing at this point. Maybe he's attempting to see if he can get his army across the night easier. Again, it's not entirely clear. Next, Sir Flemet Brax takes a force and probes the Riverlander line 20 miles south of River Run. This time, the Lannisters try to come in on foot, which indicates that they've adapted from the first recon to attempt if they can get across the river easier without horses. This proves only slightly more successful as two Westermen reach the West Bank before they're killed by Malister Knights. Then we hear about another incursion in the north, but the Vance is turning back another probe. All this indicates to me that the things are going well for the Tullys, right? But Brienne states that this is just the brush of Tywin's fingers. The main punch is yet to come. George does a great job of making us feel the bigger picture unfolding just beyond the horizon, even while showing us only a small fraction of it. Like Shakespeare, he uses messengers to give us a sense of the battle he can't show us from this limited perspective. He gradually raises the stakes throughout the chapter, even with the climax happening off screen. You did such a good job talking about the setting and the strategy, so I just wanted to talk a bit about the gorgeous imagery in this part of the chapter. As with the Whispering Wood, keeping our POV at a distance means George can be impressionistic with the battle itself. It's just the glint of steel from afar, just the flight of the fire arrows. It's all martial artistry, disconnected from death. But then the bodies start to flow downstream. I love this, because that which makes the battle real, that which makes the deadly consequences clear, is the river that makes House Tully what it is, that is protecting them. It's as if the rivers Catalan loves so much have been corrupted by war and death, delivering corpses like those draping the battlements of the castle. It's in keeping with what you were saying earlier about Edmure's army as it rode off with its, the armor and the banners. The fire arrows themselves are strangely beautiful. The corpses they produce, not as much. Mm. The overall aesthetic supports this tone. As I've said before, Catalan's A Clash of Kings storyline takes the form of a rainbow, an arc represented in colors. Dawn broke, introducing us to the light spectrum with the morning light glittering off of Rob's sword and new crown at the start of Catalan 1. From there, we moved through the vibrant shades of red and rose at Renly's camp in Bitterbridge, the bright yellow of Stannis's banner at Storm's End, and the deep greens of Renly's tent and armor as he died. Catalan 4, that middle chapter where time seemed to stop and space seemed to unravel, plunged us from dawn where we started into deep dark night. So even when we returned to day, as Catalan returned to River Run in her last chapter, her mood was permanently altered, her desperate hope in dawn giving way to despair. So we proceed through the light blues of the river water and the Tully Banner to the dark blues and purples keeping the rainbow going as this chapter develops. Those brief sparks of fire in the night, the light glinting off armor, that's all that's left hmm. of the wave of color and possibility earlier in this storyline. It's down to like the crumbs, the fragments. They only highlight the gloom gathering around them now. And come Catalan's final chapter in this book, they will give way entirely to black as the rainbow ends and midnight comes. Excellently said. I, I love it. We just like, we're basically ice and fire here, basically going on yes, here. Me yes. with the worship, you with the poetry. It's fantastic. I love it. It's so good. 
But now that there's some time to kill before more Lannisters are killed, Catelyn decides that now is the time to follow up on a hanging plot thread from Catelyn 5. You guys remember those bodies that were hanging from the wall that Catelyn and Brienne see on the way into River Run? Catelyn has a desire to know more. So she decides to send some booze over to Sir Cleos for a reason that he'll be drunk and chatty. She waits until nightfall to ensure this is especially true. And whatever your feelings about Catelyn Stark did, only one thing, maybe a few things wrong. She is kind of savvy in doing this. She starts the conversation with Cleos Frey by saying that she knows he's a good guy because he's Water Frey's grandson, which... <laughs> Wow. This leads Sir Cleos immediately to jump around like a maniac and blurting out the terms that Tyrion sent to Rob. And despite Catelyn's stated desire for peace that she's been attempting for the entirety of the book, she does realize that these terms are fucking unacceptable. But she thinks that maybe exchanging Jaime for Arya and Sansa was something worth considering. But then she immediately backs off of that because she recognizes the danger that a release Jaime would be. I think it's interesting here is, is that what we have in this chapter is that the false terms, because all of the terms that Tyrion sends to Catelyn were intended to keep the Starks and the Lannisters negotiating in order to maneuver Tywin in time to get in place to actually strike a death knell to the Stark cause. These are not actual true terms on Tyrion's part as he sends to the Starks, but this is something that Catelyn sees as a potential avenue for hope for the future. Catelyn... <sighs> then asks after Sansa and Arya's well-being to Sir Cleos Frey. And this causes our brave Sir Cleos to start sweating and trying to lie drunkenly, which is real hard to do. No, babe, I only had two beers. What? what? No, <laughs> just two. After more questioning, Cleos admits to only seeing Sansa and that Cersei was indisposed for the day. Tyrion was the one making the calls, which bothers Catelyn due to him being very, very guilty of the attempt on Bran's life, right? But when, but then she thinks about how Tyrion wasn't behind Ned's death, actually. Also, Tyrion had saved her life on the high road on up to the Eyrie. Again, George is keeping the narrative open on who was really behind the cat's ball attempt on Bran's life and has Catelyn doubting again whether Tyrion was behind it. And at the same time, George is setting us up perfectly for the showdown between Catelyn and Jaime in her next and last chapter in the book. This is the dry run for that, so to speak. I guess it's more the wet run because Cleos drinks all the booze. <laughs> Cleo's Frey, he's he's a lesser version of Jamie, right? Like Lancel, he's a more mm -hmm. Freyish version. He's a weedier Lannister. So Catelyn's ploy with the booze succeeds on him, but she fails on Jamie because Jamie is made of sterner stuff. She is able to play Cleos like a fiddle, playing on courtesies and then showing the steel beneath when he gives away his own deceit. She will not be able to pry Jamie apart so easily. And this reflects how Catelyn still feels somewhat in control here. And that will change after Bran and Rickon are supposedly killed by Theon. After that, she will consider that which she deems unacceptable here, trading Jaime for Arya and Sansa to try to get at least some of her remaining children back. Hmm. She dwells at length on whether she can trust Tyrion, concluding here only that everything is too thorny and naughty to know. Life is just too complicated. It's easier for people whose answer is always a sword. Hmm. The power of grief will overwhelm her doubt and leave her with the only option to preserve what's left of her family, blindly trusting her enemies. And that is a terrible spot for Catelyn to be in. But hey, there's at least dinner to look forward to, right? That's something. We're all, yeah, there's something to look forward to. And it, it was only in this reread that I realized that George structures a lot of Catelyn's journeys in A Clash of Kings around food and supper in particular. I mean, from Renly's feast to fasting before the shadow comes to two dinners in the chapter, in this chapter to the heartbreak of Catelyn's final Clash of Kings chapters, where she reveals that Bran and Rickon are dead to Brienne. George uses food as the architecture for many of Catelyn's scenes in A Clash of Kings. And I think here in this scene could have been filler between the battles to give an artificial sense of time progressing forward in order to allow Edmure to win his battle at the end of this chapter. Well, we just have to have this scene so we can sh kind of show that the time is moving forward, right? That's not what George does, though. George uses this scene as an opportunity to learn more of Brienne's backstory and get a sense of Catelyn's mindset as we hurtle towards Sir Clash of Kings endgame. We get another song from Ryman the Rhymer with some more death metal imagery of stars being the eyes of the wolf and the wind of, as their song, and everybody is howling and it's crazy and everyone's getting drunk. It's great. And I do kind of wonder if that's a subtle reference to the others and their cold blue eyes. I don't know precisely what George is going for there, but I do like it. I like it. Catelyn is fine with the song now if it gives the men courage, which reconnects with their earlier thoughts about whether patriotic songs drive boys towards violence and war. But then Brienne upsets that apple cart by talking about how she knew all of the songs and knew them all by heart. 
This reminds Catelyn of Sansa. And here I think George is giving Brienne an identity outside of the quote unquote tomboy architecture that he sometimes can be thrown against a character like Brienne and a character like Arya. But Catelyn's mind is still dwelling on her conversation with Sir Cleos. And she talks about how Sansa loves singers, though few ever came north to Winterfell. And the one that one of the ones, the famous one is that one of the singers that came up there, uh, Sansa kind of in prison for about a half a year before Catelyn and Ned finally told her that they have to let this guy go. The songs, though, for Catelyn at this point have kind of turned against her, though, where once Catelyn told Sansa that she would hear so many songs and learn the high harp when she got to King's Landing, Catelyn knows that she was wrong. The songs and stories that Sansa fell in love with at King's Landing were shimmering illusions that were violently torn down on the King's Road. During the turning of the hand, when her father was murdered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, Catelyn is not guilty of some sin as a parent in telling Sansa about the opportunities she would find in King's Landing, but she recognizes that she helped feed an unrealistic portrait of what life would be like in a place that wasn't Winterfell. And not to lend too much criticism on Catelyn, because I never do that on this podcast, but Catelyn knew some of the danger that she was exposing Sansa to, given that she had the message from Lysa. But Catelyn was a believer in the songs and stories, believing that the norms of Westeros would protect her daughters from the predations of evil men and women. Again, the terrible truth that Catelyn discovers in A Song of Ice and Fire is that the societal norms which kept her safe in the past, they don't exist anymore. She asks the gods for forgiveness for her parental sins of leading Sansa astray. Brienne has also been exposed to songs, as she alluded to earlier. For her, the songs were a thing to inspire a night of summer to ride off to war. But they were also a source of embarrassment, too. Lord Selwyn Tarth kept the singers about seemingly to entertain his female guests from across the narrow sea. And Brienne recounts one of her father's paramours who came to even star a hall with purple eyes and sang so lovely. Maybe she was from Volantis? I'm not exactly sure. Catelyn notes that Brienne closes her long, thick fingers, attempting to hide them from view. Brienne is self-conscious about her appearance and hides away the parts that she thinks are ugly or fall short of the beauty she admires in others. But Brienne herself never sang for her dad, and she never sang for Renly either. For Brienne, her quote-unquote unwomanly features became weapons that others used against her to put her down, to remind her of how she falls short of the ideal Westerosi woman and the beauty standards that they're supposed to uphold. Renly's fool, too, when in the army, made cruel japes about Brienne instead of having her sing. Catelyn tries to reassure Brienne and ask if Brienne would sing for her, but Brienne refuses and wants to go now. <sighs> I think it's important to emphasize that Martin isn't using the scene to do a check-in with how the women fare in this world known as Westeros. Uh, rather, it's how two women, one who has always done her duty as a woman and one who is an outlier to traditional feminine norms, are both hamstrung by the patriarchal culture of Westeros. The songs and stories led Catelyn to believe that she could survive in this world and that everything would work out for her. She extended that viewpoint to Sansa, and now both Catelyn and Sansa are miserable. But when the songs aren't lying to Catelyn and Sansa, they're weapons. And they're weapons that are used to shove non-conforming women like Brienne into her place. And now everyone is sad. <laughs> and now I'm sad too, but it was so beautifully said, sir. So worth it. Worth the sadness. Thank you. And all those dinner scenes, of course, point toward the Red Wedding, in which slaughter will be cued by a song, and the musicians wield crossbows against their guests. There the wolf howls will be not be ones of victory, but of grief. Even before that particularly brutal intersection between narrative and reality, myth-making and mortality, we see the same dynamic at work here. Catelyn is happy to let them sing if it makes them brave for the trials ahead, because the trials ahead are all she can think about anymore. It's a cynical sergeant's perspective on bonding rituals mm. they have to stand outside. It's a reckoning with how the stories provide the, the essential ingredient of courage, yet by that same token, the, the meaning of stories, the power of stories is something that can be lost as easily as courage. It's an evanescent thing, powerful yet immaterial. A guttural primal wolf howl spun out into an entire inner world of metaphors, of dreams. Mm. The creative spark is one of the major reasons for, you know, being. George has talked about his characters being like his children. But like any source of meaning, like any other reason for persisting in existence, it can be used against you in its absence or in its corruption. Sansa longed for the singers, not only because they were rare, but because Winterfell itself is not quite like that romantic world. 
Catelyn knows it. Her POV started with her saying the Winterfell Godswood was so much different than the pleasant one down in River Run. That's not to say Winterfell is a world of harsh-bitten realism. Quite the opposite. There are a few places in Westeros with more magical resonance. But it's not a place of expressive chivalry. It's a place of wolves, whether they are wild, like Brandon, or quiet, like Ned. Their howls are the music up there. Catelyn promised Sansa the South would be different. She could not only hear music, she could play it herself, learning the high harp. And this is a perfect metaphor for how Sansa has in fact been stripped of all agency, denied a role in playing her song and telling her story by the powers that be in the capital. The world of songs was supposed to be one in which Sansa self-actualized and became the radiant Southern queen she was always meant to be, but instead she's become a prisoner and victim mm -hmm. of repeated abuse. The irony in part is that she would have suffered as Joffrey's wife, not only as his prisoner, because marriage can be a set of chains as well. But the other le level of dreadful irony is that Catelyn feels herself complicit in snaring her own daughter. Like Cersei and Joffrey, she played a role in keeping Sansa just naive enough to ensure her own downfall. As you say, Catelyn does not bear much direct responsibility here, but again, she is sensing older, deeper currents at work than just a one-to-one -one domino fall kind of cause and effect. She is sensing her tiny part in something much larger that has ensnared her daughter. Brienne, as you said so well, brings an increasingly complex perspective to these issues in which George is deliberately blurring the line between the Arya and the Sansa to ground these tropes <laughs> in Catelyn's POV. Brienne is kind of both. She learned all the songs by heart. But just as Sansa never got to learn the high harp, Brienne was always too embarrassed to sing. Here we see, as you were saying, how the structure of custom inhibits women who don't conform to the ideal and women who do, just in different ways. Brienne was made mock of, a convenient social scapegoat for reality's failure to live up to the songs. She isn't pretty enough for that world to be real. And that goes hand in hand with how Brienne feels really awkward about her own body, as George captures so well here with her trying to hide her fingers. And that goes hand in hand with how awkward she feels about sex, as we're gonna see with Jamie. Sansa, on the other hand, looks pretty enough to be treated as a prized possession, a plaything to be trotted out to fit Joffrey's tableau. Joffrey plays the song, Renly plays the song, Edmure plays the song, Brienne and Sansa loves the songs best, but must do as they're told within them. Catelyn feels caught in between here, although she has more in common with Sansa in terms of upbringing and overall worldview. Adulthood has taught her terrible lessons, and so she pities Sansa for her naivete. But when she tries, on the other hand, to comfort Brienne via naivete, <laughs> the language of stories and songs, it only furthers Brienne's alienation because she knows she doesn't belong there. She knows it embarrasses her. There's no way out. Everyone seems hopelessly separated and permanently sad. No wonder Catelyn takes heart in victory. Victory? Is that the right word we're going to use here? Victory? Yes. Victory. Victory. Yes. That was, a, that was, again, really well said too, as well. Oh, thank you. So after Catelyn interrogates slash threatens Close Frey and then shares a dinner with Brienne, news arrives from the front. This time we find out Tywin's hammer blow finally fell in the Riverlands. Tywin attempted a dozen different crossings to get into the Riverlands, which just goes to show how desperate Tywin was to save his own lands and gold and willing to abandon his own children and grandchildren down in King's Landing. The largest battle was fought at a place called Stone Mill, a location we don't know the exact place for, but seemingly might be near Pink Maiden Castle. It seems that all of the intelligence gathered by Tywin on whether to try for a mounted or dismounted crossing led to Tywin deciding on a mounted crossing with Sir Gregor Clegane and Strongboar Craycall leading the attack across this particular ford. The interesting angle is that Edmure himself played a direct role in this battle and had his reserve near enough to launch a counterattack, and this to me indicates that Edmure kept some of those scouts and outriders that Catelyn saw back in Catelyn 5 on the east bank of the Red Fork in order to have advanced knowledge of where Tywin's main attack would come. It also seems that instead of having static observation points to monitor Tywin's movements, they were mobile and shadowing Tywin's main host and reporting back to the West Bank. We saw the one outrider write up on Catelyn in her last chapter, which I think does lend evidence to this idea of indicating of roving patrols and movement along the east bank of the Red Fork by pro-Tully forces. So, on to this particular battle itself. 
The battle was bloody with Gregor's men gaining a foothold on the west bank of the Red Fork before Edmure's reserve cavalry came pounding down and killed most of the Lancer dudes on the west bank to include Lord Leo Lefford. Unfortunately, Sir Gregor Clegane was merely wounded in the battle, and given that all of the mountain's men show back up in a storm of swords, that is the named ones, it seems that none of those guys were killed in this battle either. Edmure reports that the Lancers have been defeated and are retreating or feigning movement to the southeast, which, yeah... It's not a feint, and it's not really a retreat. If certain riders from Bitterbridge hadn't reached Tywin's army, Tywin would have continued attacking the fords until hell or high water. As Britain reports in A Clash of Kings in A Storm of Swords, though, riders from Bitterbridge arrived at Tywin's camp at some point during the battle, and this is what caused Tywin to take his army and wheel around and move southeast towards the headwaters of the Blackwater. For now, though, this seems like a complete victory for Edmure, and everyone wants to celebrate. That is, except for Catelyn. Catelyn doesn't want Ryman to sing more songs. She wants no singing until the fighting is done. That's a kind of an interesting word choice on Catelyn's part. She's couching the desire for song and revelry not in stark tully victory against the Lannisters, but a cessation of but a cessation of fighting. This keeps up the line of thought that Catelyn has been thinking and saying since her final chapter in A Game of Thrones, <coughs> where she's the sole voice for peace in Rob's war council at River Run. Still, she does relent and allows cheering and alcohol to be drank in River Run in celebration. And even Ryman the Rhymer starts playing the harp at Catelyn's allowance. Again, she allows it. Catelyn is demonstrating her previous chosen daughter of Hostetelli leadership, leadership dynamic here in this scene. Even the staff at River Run defers to her when Edmure is not around. Another point here is that the entire castle is celebrating, and I just love this line by Catelyn. They'd come frightened and helpless, and her brother had taken them in when most lords would have closed their gates. Edmure's defense of all Riverlands, regardless, Riverlanders, regardless of their station, is something that endears him to all the people inside of the castle. But it also serves as a damnation for how this was not the norm for most of the lords. They would have left their people out for the lions, for the greater good. But as the celebration occurs, Catelyn feels that the sounds don't touch her, and she feels relatively unhappy. This is something she's been feeling throughout the book. As at Renly's camp, Catelyn feels as though she alone bears the burdens of mortality and uncertainty for everyone else who gets to enjoy life. The small folk are grateful for the protection of the walls, but Catelyn has her own metaphorical walls, cutting her off from their joy. In part, this is age. Renly's nights of summer felt impossibly young to her. Catelyn just can't get back the optimism she lost to the cost of doing her duty over and over again as the decades went by. But it's also the losses she suffered, which just have not been made whole. Right. I mean, it's not that Catelyn is a woman of complete and utter sorrow at this point, but she's been through a lot of trauma. <clears throat> Rob is still in danger in the West. Sansa is still being held by the Lannisters, and she has no idea if Arya is at the Red Keep or not. So this all appears like a major victory for her side. But has she gained her daughters back? Is Rob more safe? So one more time. <coughs> Excuse me. This appears a major victory for her side, but has she gained her daughters back? Is Rob more safe? No, it's still status quo for Catelyn. They've won everywhere, and she's no closer to getting Arya and Sansa back. She's no closer to having Rob put down his sword and live a life of family and peace. So she decides to make for her father's solar to find out what Tywin might be up to in retreating to the southeast. And like any good leader, the first recon she does is a map recon, tracing the movement of Tywin's army to the southeast, realizing that the Lancers are probably now at the headwaters of the Blackwater Rush. She closes the map book, feeling more uneasy despite all the victories her, her side has won. She's afraid now, more than ever not knowing why. And then we turn the page to A Clash of Kings Brand 6 and the death of the Stark Cause in the War of the Five Kings. As I said, part of why Catelyn feels so unhappy even amidst victory is age. Part of it is the losses she has suffered. But another part is this almost prophetic sense of dread. Catelyn as the Cassandra figure of how Stark knows it's all going to go awry. The doom of her family is making itself known just around the periphery of her awareness. War, along with booze, suits the emotional needs of Desmond Grell. It makes the small folk think they'll be safe but it doesn't heal Catelyn's wounds because it doesn't bring her family back to her. It does not allow Rob to put up his sword, marry a fray girl, and take her home to Winterfell to make a grand babies. War has not produced peace, but further war. 
And Catelyn is drawing from her own life experience and also her intuition to sense that it's going to get worse. Logically, they're winning. But these are the nights of summer and winter is coming. As you say, George cuts right from this to the fall of Winterfell, which we will do next week. <clears throat> and what an emotionally devastating chapter that is in A Song of Ice and Fire. But huh, yeah, this, this chapter is also equally amazing and devastating, even as the triumph is being experienced by all of these men here at River Run. So that takes us into our foreshadowing and grammar portion of this episode. So a new hashtag, hashtag RLJ watch. Catelyn mentions that John has his father's look about him. Sorry, Cat. It's actually his mom's look. That's a lovely irony George plays with a couple of times. Of course, John has the Stark look, unlike uh, most of Catelyn's children. But it's not yeah, it's not the father's look. That's that's Lyanna's look, actually. The father's <laughs> look is Rhaegar Targaryen. Nothing like that at all. Mm -hmm. So as uh, Roos says in his message that we learn about in this chapter, he will indeed take Harrenhal in Arya's next chapter. Although, thankfully, he won't kill Everyone inside to do so. <laughs> just a lot of people. Just a lot of killing and torturing happens when Roose Poulton takes over. Right. I mean, it's the sa new lords, same as the last lords, right? I mean, that's essentially mm, the exactly dynamic that right. plays in, in Arya's chapters because he kills a shit ton of people when he gets into Heron Hall. And Arya, of course, then gets tarnished with the reputation of being a uh, weasel, the person who has weasel soup. I reread that chapter uh, a few days ago, and it's still really, really good as well. It's just like devastating at the at the very end, too. Roos also mentions how a living Ramsay would threaten his trueborn children, and uh, yeah, this is exactly what we see when Roos comes north and casually says that Ramsay will kill all of his trueborn children, just like he did for Domeric, the only trueborn child that Roos has been able to bear so far. And then in Theon's final dance chapter, where Fat Waldo is pregnant and Ramsay and Roos are fighting on the dais, Theon notices Fat Waldo looking terrified, which has led to many fans to believe the fighting was over Fat Waldo's unborn child and his status as the heir to the Dreadford. Yeah, I definitely think that's the case. The fact that Fat Walder is, is is first introduced as pregnant in that scene, and then she has a terrified look on her face. I think that's definitely leading up to Ramsay doing something quite brutal. Maybe not beat for beat like he did in the show, but I think that's going to be the source of, of Roos and, and Walder's <laughs> downfall for sure. So also on kind of the, the characters on the periphery of this chapter, Rob is mentioned as marching on the crag in this chapter as his campaign through the Westerlands continues. And he will have taken that castle by Catelyn Seven, and therein he will meet and marry Jane Westerling to his doom, sadly. Yay, Jane. I love Jane. I think Jane's a great character. But I think I, she's uh, a very good character, actually. Like, sketched out in only a couple scenes in A Storm of Swords and a devastating reappearance in The Feast for Crows. She's a character that could have very easily been very stock and just kind of like the nice one that Rob fell in love with. Here she is, everyone. Um, Talisa in the show kind of veered into a lot, a lot of the times <laughs> for me. But, but Jane is a distinct character, so I like her a lot. Yeah, and I think uh, having recently uh, read uh, Stephen Atwell's piece on Catelyn Five, she comes across as a very mm -hmm. dense and complicated figure in in the Stark storyline, which I think has been left aside with the with the elevation of Talisa. And I'm sure we'll have the Talisa versus Jane discussion when we get far further into yes, a Storm of Swords. Absolutely, we will. Finally, for foreshadowing groundwork, hashtag Stoneheart coming. Here's the quote from the chapter: For a woman, a mother, the way was stonier and mm. harder to know. George is laying more and more foundation for Catelyn becoming Stoneheart. It's very likely that he knew that was Catelyn's fate at this point. And he starts to ramp up the wordplay, even subtle wordplay like this here in this chapter to indicate that Catelyn's future lies in the form of the undead version of herself, namely as Lady Stoneheart. George has said that the, the change the show made to the books he most regrets was leaving out the Lady Stoneheart transformation and even putting aside whatever she gets up to in terms of plot. You can understand why just because of how well that transformation is baked into her character beforehand in ways large and small as you say it's it's just a uh, it's one of those twists when you get to the storm of swords it's jaw dropping it's mind blowing you couldn't have seen it coming but once you realize what it is you're looking at you go oh of course uh -huh. that's perfect that the, all the rage and despair didn't just vanish when she died it came back with her that's great that's what makes her part of what makes her character so wonderful, and it feeds just so well from this this chapter into uh, this the Stoneheart portion. We were saying in Catelyn Five that we see the the advance of Catelyn towards Stoneheart here. We see another step in that progression toward the Stoneheart characterization, which will be dominating Catelyn going forward. Exactly right. So, what do we got in the in the <laughs> of our irons in the fire for our theory <clears throat> discussion portion of the episode, sir? What do we got? Well, first, I just have to say thank you for letting me do the uh, let me pick this topic for for this week because uh, you have you have wonderful literary discussions, and I love like talking about like 
the aspects of Westerosi society that interact with our own experiences and how it, it impacts us in, in living in the real world these days. Sure, but for me, sure. because, because it was me and because I'm silly and ridiculous, I wanted to broach this topic to you. And it's just a statement more than anything else. And uh, it's that the Throne Show did the Riverlands and Edmure Tully dirty. Thank you. I'll take your questions now. <laughs> and that'll wrap us up, folks. No, but no. <laughs> Ex explicate on your thesis, sir. Okay. <clears throat> so Edmure Tully is... Uh, not just a favorite minor character of mine, but it, he tends to be an overlooked character mm -hmm. in A Song of Ice and Fire, both in the books, but especially in the show. Because in the wake of Game of Thrones season eight, sometimes it's it's hard to remember how Ed Tully and the Riverlands factored in it all in that show. I mean, early seasons of the show didn't really factor the Riverlands in at all. I mean, there was the twins in season one and Heron Hall in season two and Arya's walking somewhere in, in, in season two. We had no real sense where Rob Stark was fighting. We had a pared down versions of both the Battle of the Green Fork and the Battle of the Whispering Woods, which makes sense because both battles were condensed for budgetary reasons. But we never got a sense of where these locations actually were in the narrative. And River Run, arguably the most central location to the Stark, Tully versus Lannister portion of the War of the Five Kings, didn't make an appearance in the show until season three. And it was only then that we were introduced to Brendan and Edmure Tully. Boy, what a shit show of an introduction that was i mean i was both disappointed and relieved to search youtube to try and find a compilation of all edmure scenes in game of thrones and didn't find a single compilation at all disappointed because it would have been a lot easier to watch all of edmure scenes uh, in, in sequential order as research for this episode relieved because maybe this indicates how little people think about edmure on the show and then they'll open the books and find one of the few genuine heroes in a song of ice and fire maybe i don't know because in the show edmure tully comes across this shallow arrogant elitist fop we get Edmure being a dumb dumb early on and his inability to hit Hoster Tully's pyre with a fire arrow with Brendan being especially dismissive of his now Lord Edmure grabbing the bow out of his hand and shooting the fire arrow and tossing it back at him, you know, very much with a lot of flourish. The Battle of the Forts was also good and it's down to one battle, which of course took off, occurred off page, similar to what happens in a, in a Clash of Kings at the Stone Mill. And we get Edmure relating that he was involved in that battle to win glory by defeating Gregor Clegane in battle. Edmure then proceeded to lose 208 soldiers at the Battle of the Stone Mill in order to gain that glory that he was seeking, the same glory that Rob had been winning during the War of the Five Kings. There's no mention of Edmure bringing the small folk to River Run to keep them safe. Edmure is then scolded by his uncle Brendan and lectured by Rob, in which, after the, he relates about the Battle of the Stone Mill, which leads to Edmure having to marry Rosalind Frey and then the Red Wedding, where he's taken prisoner. Edmure then reappears in season six of the show as a captain of the Freys with the ensuing deuce and the threat to hang him if Brendan doesn't surround the castle. All good so far, right? Going really good because this is all from A Feast for Crows, and I love that scene from A Feast for Crows. <sighs> but then Jamie then uses Edmure to order the castle to surrender with a yelling Brendan, ordering the Riverlanders to kill his nephew, and then Edmure taking control of the castle and ordering his uncle's death. Like, oh my fucking god, what is going on with this show? Edmure makes his final appearance in the show at the great, small, sort of not a council, in which he offers himself as the king of Westeros. Sansa then tells Edmure famously to sit down, uncle, which led to my favorite Game of Thrones tweets of all time by at TV Kev Lance, in which he has George R. R. Martin, I will share three book twists with you. Stannis burns his daughter and Hodor means hold the door. David Benioff and D.B. Weiss, what's the third? Martin, I'm going to dunk on Edmure Tully so hard. <laughs> That tweet aside, I, I cannot begin to say how thoroughly aggravating the show's treatment of the Riverlands and Edmure Tully was. The show strips his true nobility away, making his entire character the butt of every joke or dressing down given in the series. That being said, Martin and the narrative lend plenty of criticism on, onto Edmure Tully. He was a bit vainglorious. He did fight at the Battle of the Fords in part because he wanted to win his share of the glory that Rob had won. Edmure is hot-headed and a womanizer too, and he has an empty space where the love of his father Hoster should have been. But he's also balanced out by being somewhat of something of a good dude, at least relative to the norms of Westerosi nobility, as Catelyn points out in this chapter. He had a good plan at the Fords and executed it violently. And I was always told that a good plan executed violently is better than a perfect plan half-assed. Edbeard does get dressed down by Robin Brendan in A Storm of Swords, but George imbues enough nuance to the matter that we are going to debate whether Edbeard bears any culpability come A Storm of Swords, Catelyn too. And he does miss his shots to, on Hoster's boat. But Brendan relates that Hoster missed his shots too when his father's boat, when it was his father's boat. And he treats Edmure with the respect due his station and has here. 
Lord, my Lord Edmure, let me take the bow. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. Edmure does get River Run to surrender to Feast for Crows, but not before spiriting Uncle Brendan out of River Run with a probable brother without banners plan to go ham on the Lancers thereafter. What I'm ultimately saying is that in the throne show, Edmure is a punching bag masquerading as a character. In the books, George drew together a full and complex secondary character who tried to do the right thing by his people and fucked up many, many times. As you can probably tell, I prefer the latter version of Edmure by a lot. I think that's a perfectly stated argument, sir. And I, I share so many of your criticisms of the show on this count. I think I'm more sympathetic to them with regards to Edmure as a character and less regarding the overall situation of the Riverlands and how it affects the plot. I think it's, you know, it's difficult to devote screen time to making secondary characters complex. I think we also saw some of this at work with Stannis, although I think the, the, the showrunners had a kind of a particular angle on him and on Renly that I think led to the character kind of being executed the way he was. I think with Edmure, there may just not have been much much room to really sell him in a way, this this book character in a way that wouldn't just come off muddled and, and uncertain, mm. as, as the, often the debates about his book character kind of seem to suggest. And the, the temptation is to use him for easy comic relief because he's not the main character and because he does mess up a lot. And I do, uh, I, I do understand that instinct. I think you know, it, like like a lot of decisions in the sh in the show. I think the initial decisions are completely understandable. I think they end up having ripple effects for how they change the rest of the story. And I think you really do see that with how they execute the Riverlands because it's just it's so geographically vague in the seasons where Rob is alive. And that's you know, obviously the books have a much easier time with things like that. But it, it robs the the show, I think, of a lot of distinct drama with regards to the sudden reversal where, like, Tywin's army gets bounced like an air hockey puck off of Edmure and ends <laughs> up at the Blackwater. Like, that's wild and dramatic, and the timing is great, and you do need every piece of that to make it work. So having half the pieces there and ends up just kind of feeling unfulfilling. And so when, when the Riverlands returns in Season 6, it very much has the feeling of, oh, right, the Riverlands. <laughs> <laughs> what have they been up to this whole time? We, we better check in with them. It like has, you know, I, I enjoy the Star Wars prequels, but like Revenge of the Fifth has that moment when it's like, like the whole Jedi Council is suddenly like, oh, right, the Wookiee planet. That's really important. We really got to go check it. Like you haven't mentioned the Wookiee planet once in this unfolding war. And, you know, the Thrones show had that problem sometimes. And I think some of it was just trying to uh, pluck the best parts or the, the most fan favorite parts of Feast and Dance out yeah. and keep them in the show. That's definitely what was going on with River Run in season six, as you were saying. Like, oh, everyone loves the Jamie Blackfish standoff. We'll have a version of that. But it's like how uh, Roger Ebert said about Battlefield Earth that the director understands that other directors sometimes tilt their cameras to get the Dutch tilt <laughs> angle, but he does not understand why they do that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the same thing might have happened here. And it's like, like the Jamie Blackfish thing of everyone is awesome, but all the context of it is really what makes that work. Like mm. the follow up with Ed Muir of working with the Blackfish and more conspiracies unfold and Jamie has trapped. But like in the show, they just move on from the Riverland so quickly and abruptly and Brienne is there and then not. And then that doesn't really matter for their storyline. It just, it feels like, it feels like a diversion. It feels like just a mm. way for, to get Jamie out of the city. So Cersei can, to, can do some wildfire stuff instead of this, this real cementing of all these characters involved. So, you know, I, I obviously, I feel the same way about you in terms of Edmure's book character, and I much prefer him over the show, but like, I always try to be sympathetic in terms of adaptation of like, what's easy to sure. do and what's hard to do. And what's, you know, I understand falling back on Edmure as, 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 a, as, a, as a punching bag, as you say, but like the, the, the state of the Riverlands and what's happening in the Riverlands is actually really important to the story in the books because that's where the mm -hmm. war happens. <laughs> Yep. You know, the war is actually not actually happening in the Reach for the most part, yeah. right? Or in Dorne or in the Vale or not even in the North until you get to Theon's invasion. Mm -hmm. For the most part, the, the war is happening here. So having a real perspective on it as a place of, of specific geography and specific people to be mourned is important, not just for fulfilling the book fans' wildest dreams, but for really giving a sense of the cost of the war. And this is why people don't take, you know, show fans are not as into the brotherhood as book fans for this exact reason, mm. because the brotherhood are all about the cost of the war in the Riverlands. Ed Muir is, is on a different part of that. But yeah, I think, I think there was a, a ripple effect in, in transforming the, the whole of the Riverlands that they were just kind of, you know, grist for the mill for the characters passing through. And I think something was lost there. Grist for the stone mill, right? Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> No, I, I think you're absolutely right. I think there's there's an aspect of adaptation where we should be sympathetic to how the show has a limited budget. As they've talked about, they really wanted to do the battle. George really wanted to do the battle of the Green Fork. They really wanted to do the battle of the Whispering Wood. Sure. Said they couldn't because they didn't have the budget in early seasons of Game of Thrones that they would have for seasons six, seven, and eight. 
especially of, of Game of Thrones. I, but you're you're right about the the thing. I think that you're you're right about everything. But I mean, the thing you're the most right about is is that the Riverlands helps to set us up for understanding the cost of the War of the Five Kings and what it actually brings about to the people of Westeros, and that's namely suffering and bloodshed by people who didn't really have it coming. We do get some of that in when we get to Harren Hall in season two of the show and Arya's arc specifically, but we don't see much in the way of like the carnage and destruction of that is brought by the Lannisters on the Riverlands because the Riverlands works as such a ambiguous place, amalgamous even that we don't just, we don't know where, where it is, where it, where it exists. We don't even know. We don't even know that the Tullys exist as a faction we know that they exist in, in by name by as a name faction. We don't know that they exist as a faction in the story until we get to season three of the show. I think it ends up making a lesser story, and I don't want to say it undercuts the horror of the Red Wedding at, at all. But I do think that if we had been following some of these characters from at least the first season of the show, understanding some of the geography, at least from the first season of the show onward we probably would have had a more impactful ending to season three of the show and the and the red wedding, of course. But, of, but again, I, I can't really, I don't want to lend too much damnation on the showrunners necessarily, but I do think they could have done better. And I think that it's good that we have these books, which do of course do better, which obviously because these were the books that inspired the show, which adapted the books <laughs> from, from the, uh, the version that they were into uh, the small screen. But I, I like, I like Edmure in, in the books a lot better. I do think that Tobias Menzies is a fantastic actor. Uh, and I just feel like he could have been so much more. He could have played an actual Edmure, a more book centric version of Edmure, which would have been more fulfilling and would have spoken more to the cost of war and spoken to more of the interesting and complex psycholo psychology and dynamics behind the character that is Edmure Tully. I, I totally agree. I think um, I can, I can understand the decisions that led to the Riverlands being what they are on the show, but the Red Wedding has its has its punch and impact, and the Jamie and the Blackfish can have their punch and impact because of the context. And when you lose that context, then they become, uh, you know, knockout moments in isolation, which are still very powerful. But then the I think the appeal starts becoming more like watching a close sport sporting event more mm -hmm. than watching bittersweet drama. Sometimes, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like watching Game of Thrones, even the best parts of Game of Thrones, a lot of time felt like go go get to the end zone. You can do it more than I was watching. <laughs> like oh no, the people I love. So and there was there was no one moment when that happened. I think it was a slow just trickling down, and this is just one angle on that. It is. But, you know, we have these books. We have the show. The books, the show, as George has talked about over and over again. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're both good in their own ways, and the books, happen, the books happen to be great. And I think that's a good place to kind of wrap us up for this analysis on A Clash of Kings, Catlin 6. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you have the chance, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, SoundCloud, Podbean, Spotify, anywhere and everywhere where you find our podcasts. You can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash notacast, A-S-O-I-A-F. You can follow us on Twitter at notacast, A-S-O-I-A-F, or shoot us an email at notacast, A-S-O-I-A-F at gmail.com. You can find me at poor Quentin on Twitter or at poorquentin.com. And you can find me at Brenda Beefish on Twitter, Brenda Beefish on Reddit, and my website is Wars and Politics, Vice and Fire .wordpress.com. We want to shout out and thank our high lords and ladies on Patreon, Red Relu himself, who has renounced his allegiance to the Squishers, Lady of a Thousand Words, Septon Eastwood of Introvert Isle, Septon Maribald, the Shoeless Sage, Sister Winter, Lady of the Wolfswood, Nessie the Elusive, Warden of the Neck, Defender of the North, and Keeper of Secrets, Sandy the Dragon, Blood of Queen Daenerys, and Lady of Jameson, Lady Britt, Bastard Mistress of Harrenhal, Sir Thomas the Raven Knight, Lord of Blackwood, Lady Dillsdale, the Star Spear of Crescent Hill, Sir Way, of course, Man Matt, Warden of the Sanguine Shore, Lord Mark Connington, heir to Griffin's Roost, Lord Sam Kay, Sir Michael Mertens, Wisdom Benjicott, Alchemist of Sets and Quanta, Mage of the Arts of Bull and De Morgan, Tibbs the Great of House Catnapping, Lord J. Manderley, Baker of the Frey Pies, Septon, Merrifull Head of Hair, Lady Silverwing, Joe Snow, King of the Metro North and Protector of the Tri-State, Kaboth the Unfrozen, Lord of the Bricks and Castle Crimson Light. Sir Keith of House Corbray, Wilder of the Lady Forlorn. Lord Andrew, Warden of the Dubai Sands. Ryan Noy, Forger of the Mighty Hammer and Keeper of the King's Anvil. Lord Young of the Ghostwoods. And our newest High Lady, Lady Mira Reed, Wilder of Dark Sister, Slayer of Tinfoil. <laughs> so thank you as always to our High Lords and Ladies, and welcome to Lady Mira, Slayer of Tinfoil. Yeah, thank you all very much. And of course, welcome to Lady Mira. I saw you on the Nanoslack and appreciate your presence there. So join us next week as we head back to Winterfell just in time to see it fall to 
fucking Theon Greyjoy? God, this is the worst. In a Clash of Kings brand six. And we'll be June and and we'll be joined by a brand new guest, Stanford Fraser, who you can follow on Twitter. He's a great guy, a friend of ours, and uh, he's going to bring a lot of great perspective to this this new chapter in, in a Clash of Kings. Yes, we've been looking to have on Stanford for a while. It's going to be a lot of fun to have him with us for Brand Six, a, a gloomy and depressing chapter. So it'll be good to have some company for that. Even more gloomy and depressing than this one. So it'll be good to do, good to have three of us around. It shall be indeed. So thank you so much for listening. Thanks to those of you who watched us, and we will see you guys next week. All righty. All right. Thank you for watching us, folks. We appreciate you as always. You all are the best. Yeah. Well, welcome back to Lewis, too. Um, hope you're doing well, buddy. Yes, absolutely. Hope you're doing better, buddy. Um, yeah. Admir, poor Admir. True. <laughs> At least there's always Rome. There's all, yeah, that's true. Did, did you watch always Rome? Rome. Hmm? Did you watch Rome? I have not watched Rome yet. I still not. I know, right? I've still... well, I mean, limited time, right? I've got to watch. I was I? I got. I got. I caught. I. I guess I can scroll up through the notes. What was that? What was that war movie on the Eastern Front? What was it called again? Oh, Come and See. I saw Frank was talking about. Of course, Frank has seen it. Um, yeah, Come and See. A Russian. It's a Russian from the eighties. It's on the Criterion Channel, and I think it might be available other places. But yeah, that's a that's a brutal fucking movie. I don't. Rec I don't recommend that as just like as a lark to anyone. Just like looking. Alpha on a movie tonight. No, no, no. <laughs> Get other people out of the room. Don't have anything to do the next day. Did you? Um, Hard to watch. I feel like I might have seen something. Is that the movie where they use like live ammunition for some of the scenes? It might be. I know they kill a cow in it. Like for An real. actual cow? Yeah. Like for real? One of those movies. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't. So if, whatever they do that with, <laughs> I guess. But yeah, I think it might be one of those. Yeah, they might have done so. Mm-hmm. All right. Got some questions here. Nick Bang asks, will you follow Yoke Boy's lead and not cut your hair until Winds of Winter is out? Not as a revolt, but in support of George, of course. Well, Yoke Boy, Yoke Boy looks uh, looks looks good with a tangle. Not all of us have such a such an impressive mane. Um, well, you know, my, my, my hair is, is shaggy right now because of because of the COVIDs. So I'll take <laughs> I'll I'll you know, I'll pretend it's for wins. I, I, I will I will be cutting my hair normally and regularly because I look better that way. Also, because if I try to grow my hair out, um, I have a bald spot like right here. It's about this big. You probably you can't see it because you never see because my headphones sit right over top of it. So my hair would like grow like long and I just have, have a, just a massive fucking bald spot in the back. It would be just ridiculously ugly. So I will not do that. Well, that seems reasonable, sir. I'll accept uh, your, you know. You don't. You're not going to go for. They're going to go for the Johnny Unitas look, not the hippie cut, not That's the right. Joe Namath. Courtney asked, "Do they know they're still on?" Yes, we do know the worst. <laughs> We're never not on. That's right, always on. Uh. Lewis asks, "Is Tobias Brutus in Rome?" Yes, he is. Uh, he's mm -hmm. a great actor. He plays Brutus. Um, Really uh, does a really good job of playing Brutus in, in a way that, like Brutus in the in the actual historical narrative doesn't come across the best um obviously because he killed caesar but also because uh you know he what his action led to the spark of the the as properly as as commonly understood led to the spark that was the roman civil war but mm -hmm. was just like one of many thousands of sparks which led to the, the roman civil war but he does it yes, with yes. a plum and, and really good so if you ever get you know if you ever have like free time right um check out rome it's good damn right Oh, another question, but real quick, uh, Koi Vanazi in the chat says, Catelyn realizing all is for nothing because the system failed really made me think of the end of the Irishman when all the mobsters are in jail and dying. And yeah, that's that's definitely a good comparison, that kind of mausoleum feeling sitting in of, oh, everyone I was, you know, sp I spent my joyful youth with, we're all just decaying and withering now. Yep, it's the tone. I got to finish watching that movie, so I guess that's the that's end. That's everyone. So, I know the Irishman <laughs> is too long for a lot of people. I loved all 18 hours of it personally. But, uh, <laughs> I, know it's a, I know it's a lot. I mean, I, I respect the fact that uh, they get, they basically gave the writing team just the ability to just just go wild. I mean, I think that's that's sure. that's, that's, that's the good thing about the Netflix model, but it also can be a bad thing too because you can agree. Hmm. Frank B asks, "What is poor damn Ed Mears' fate? 
killed in the Brother Without Banners ambush, opening the wind's winter, hanged by Lady Stoneheart and some dark shit in the winds of the winter. Lord Paramount of a research, excuse me, uh, Lord Paramount of a resurgent Riverlands. Laugh out loud. Why not? Something else. What do you think, sir? I would be very devastated if Stoneheart kills Edmure at the start of the wind's mm. winter, right? Yeah, I would too. I kind of feel like that's, yeah, you know, this is kind of a, a glib way to talk about it, but I kind of feel like that's Jane Westerling's job. To yeah. be like the devastating death as part of that, you know, the, the launch of Stoneheart's Crusade. Edmure, oh, I don't know. This, I mean, this gets back to like how rational really is Stoneheart right now? Like mm. how conscious is, does she have a, does she have a plan? Is there like a plan to like have things take over after the freeze or was she just like kill machine aimed at the phrase? <sighs> yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know either. I mean, it seems like, I, I think that she doesn't kill Edmure because Thomas Evans is there in the tent with Edmure and there's the great theory right. that he revealed the plan to spring Brendan free. They'll link up with Brendan somewhere down the, down the river way and they'll get over and they'll, they'll kill a bunch of Lancers and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. killing Edmure at least does not seem like it's part of the plan, at least as stated by Thomas Evans. Of course, we don't know the full extent of what Thomas Evans told Edmure. Sure, I don't think he, he mysterious. Yeah. I, I think Jane, I, I really like um, Steve Abel's theory that, uh, one of the devastating aspects of, of the Winds Winter is going to be the death of Jane Westerling mm -hmm. and potentially her being hanged by Stoneheart at the start of the uh, yeah, I the, think that's probably gonna happen, right? Because she has to because she's a traitor to the Stark cause because uh, she's been betrayed by the Westerlings without even and and Catelyn has no idea and Stoneheart has no idea that the the Westerlings were actually not all in on the conspiracy seemingly at least jane wasn't in on the conspiracy jane didn't to, seem to kill, know at all kill Rob. yeah i mean it, with edmure the only thing i could th see being a sticking point is if stoneheart goes after his wife Rosalyn. yeah uh because i get like to i think to, you know like to think edmure gets in the way there so that could potentially cause a dust up but i i doubt it's her plan off off the bat to get rid of edmure we uh, yeah. yeah so i could you know i could definitely definitely see him being restored, I suppose, to the head of the Riverlands. Although part of me goes like, you know, that it's just going to go so poorly at Riverrun with Stoneheart. Who knows if that's going to be an even, even solid foundation? I could see him still being there when that's all cleaned up, though, so to speak. I mean, George is like you were, you were referencing the episode. George has talked many, many times about how the absence of Stoneheart has many ramifications for the plot sure. of, of the Winds of Winter. So it seems like yeah. George is investing a lot of time into writing Stoneheart material for probably Jamie and Brienne's chapters and the prologue of the Winds Winter likely as well. So that to me indicates that Edmure has some role to play since Edmure will likely be rolled up into that storyline. I do think that's going to, I think there'll be a, a point in, I think there'll be a point in a Jamie chapter, probably in the Winds of Winter where we have the dynamic flipped from a Feast for Crows where mm. Jamie was the, uh, Jamie will be the prisoner and Edmure, yeah, yeah. Edmure will be the one, the 10. I think that'd be a cool kind of, that's a great point. That's probably going to happen. You're right. Yeah. That'd be right. fun. That'd be so much fun. Um, <laughs> Caitlin says I can microblade. I don't know what that means. My hair for a guest cutting it. Do you know I don't either, but it sounds very fancy. Aaron M, a sworn sword, of course, asks, I'd like to put Samir's question to you guys. Do you feel like there's a character the show didn't do dirty? Ned. Well, I mean... Again, they're, they're you know it's 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 on a spectrum. There are characters that I think kind of became the one hundred and eighty of who they are in the books, like Renly. But I think he's he's still coherent within the show's framework. I think, you know, I think it was disappointing that Stannis got shortened the way he did. But I think there is still some care given to his arc. It's just not not what we would like to see of it. And then and then it's like, well, you know, Cersei gets so much of time and attention and care lavished upon her, but I don't think it's necessarily backed up in the story. So she kind of kind of starts to fall apart. If I was going to say a character who's like, yeah, gets gets the least feels that feels the most like they were accurately translated from from book to show. I mean, I might say Ned. Yeah. What do you think? I, I think Ned is done really well. I think. I think Rob has actually done really well just in terms of like the mm. character, not the plot points, but like sure, in terms okay. of like just the mannerisms. Rob, yeah. The mannerisms and the kind of like you could see why this guy uh why Richard Madden was able to just had immediate screen charisma in order and to be able to be this leader to kind of step into his father's shoes and lead lead his army forward. So 
I think that's really well done. I think the show kind of nailed Tyrion in early seasons of the show, sure, even if they sure. didn't they kind of airbrush some of his worst acts and also his worst um things that he they told Cersei as we talked about last last week. But then, of course that kind of fell apart um after they kind of forgot about the dance with dragons um mm. <laughs> but uh but i don't know i i think oh, oh this is a really good point lena says they did joffrey really well on the show and i think that's a really good point they did joffrey really really well uh jack gleason playing joffrey was a fantastic uh played him really really well and, and translated oh, yeah. his character really well from the books to the show and he's you know he's a hard character to mess up because there's not much to joffrey so right. <laughs> just get a good actor and let him go what about sandra clegane Hmm. I think Rory McCann was great. I think he had great dynamics with other characters. I think. I think there's. I think Sandor is a little more anime-ish in the books than in the show. Mm -hmm. Like he's still gruff, but like he's got like he doesn't. You know, he doesn't look like a dog. <laughs> His mask does. And Rory <laughs> McCann, I think, was cast in because he just kind of looks like a dog. Bless him, I love him. <laughs> <laughs> but like Book Sandor has like the long gray hair. He kind of looks Stark-ish, actually. Yep. I think that's kind of the point George is going for. And it's like the implication is he'd actually be quite a looker if, you know, half his face wasn't burned off. So I, you know, I think that element to how he's kind and that's that's part that's part and parcel of how he's half sexy to Sansa. Mm. So I think that aspect of his character, I think, was dropped. I do think they nailed his relationship with Arya, though. Yeah, I think the Arya standard dynamic is really well. People are also saying that Hodor was done really well. Yeah, that's true. Sure. Um, I, I think Viserys, people are bringing up a couple. Yeah, Harry Lord was great as Viserys. I think he yes, was arguably really better than, than he was in the books. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, there's there's so much more complexity with uh, with Viserys, and they gave the the the, the, the scene with him and Jorah in season one was just phenomenal. Yes, where they're in the great team. invented scene. Yeah, it was really really good. I mean, the when the show does really really well when they get outside of the books they do really well when they keep the when they keep similar book dynamics and invent scenes with those dynamics mm -hmm. in mind from the books so Viserys comes across as yes much more interesting in, in the show than than in the books where he's a little bit one maybe two notes if I'm being generous to to Viserys in the books but having Harry Lloyd as Viserys was something that was a uh, quite good people are also saying Osha the red viper uh Tain's yeah, Oberyn. Sure. Um, Oberyn, like Oberyn, is you know more complex character than Joffrey, but again, he's kind of hard to mess up. Right, he's, he's such a force of charisma. You just have to like just go. Whereas like it's like Stannis is like ah, that's all internal for the most part. It's it's like inherently complicated. It's like I can see why you you know why why you wouldn't have an easy time adapting him. The the, the louder kind of more you know everything's on the their sleeve characters like Robert or Oberyn or Joffrey. It's like those are made for TV. Yeah, it's it's hard to kind of fuck them up for sure. Mm. Also, they're talking about Robert too. So, uh, yeah, all good stuff. <clears throat> Thomas asks, "Do you all think Jamie will fr will be will free the Red Wedding prisoners still at the Twins? If not him, then who?" So, uh, like Great John Umber and etc. They're um, all being where, brought down. Where are they right now? I thought Jamie had ordered all the prisoners to be brought down from the twins to be sent to the Westerlands, right? Or is that only Edmure at the end of a Feast for Crows? He gives that order, but I'm unclear on to whether it's being followed or not. Because it's not in <laughs> convoy as Edmure, right? It can't be. Right. Those, those guys are all at the twins. So there's no way they would just happen to be in the same place as Edmure. So unless there were just some sleight of hand, I think those have to be different things. I agree. I'm trying to think. Gosh, it's been a, it's been a minute since I've read Jamie's chapters in a Feast for Crows. I mean, and, and I and I've been doing a great job on them, and I'm trying I'm trying to remember from their episodes whether this this came up. But yeah, this I think these I think we're talking two separate clumps of convoy here. Right. Yeah. I mean, they could be. Yeah, two convoys meeting up. I think uh, the Golden Tooth would sure, be a good place would. for them to meet up, since I think that there's two roads that come from the the twins and from River Run that meet up there. So link up there, and that's where Stoneheart Springs the ambush. I think would be a yeah. Uh, Micah says, Great John, Mark Piper, and company are north coming south. They may run into Blackwater. So, okay. Blackwater's at Seaguard, right? Yeah, Seaguard. He's, he's just at... in, in, in the action somehow because he's been built up as such an asshole. So he's got to <laughs> yeah. get his somehow. Mm -hmm. 
McBay asks, why was the R plus L equals J reveal split over two seasons in Game of Thrones? Season six heavily inferred that John was Lyanna's son. I think it kind of all but all but inferred it, all but ex but it confirmed it. But we only got explicit confirmation in season seven that he's also Rhaegar's trueborn heir. Did you like that? Is this anything you know about, sir? Has this been spoken about the decision to spread this revelation out into kind of two scenes? I've never seen anything. Uh, nothing springs to my head off the off the top of my head. I mean, it just feels more like um, it feels like they they did that to kind of spread out the re the reveal, right? To kind of have the woo, John is is Lyanna's yeah, son exactly. after all, I'm, and it, it's one of my favorite scenes in in all of Game of Thrones. I mean, we lend a lot of criticism to the, to the to the throne show, especially in later seasons, but the the reveal from the Tower of Joy was an emotionally poignant moment, and the guy who played young Ned. Uh, whose name I can't remember off the top of my head, did a really good job of playing the kind of younger version of, of Sean Bean, which was really good. And having the camera go pan from the baby's face to then John's face as he's sitting in the Winterfell, sure. Winterfell Great Hall was just sure, one, yeah. one of my all-time favorite. 2001 kind of cut almost. Yeah, that's that's, mm -hmm. that's classic stuff. And yeah, I think it was in part just to kind of have big two big revelations you know, for the audience to enjoy and get some catharsis out of. But I also think in part because just this backstory was kind of so anemic in the show up to this point, they were trying to tell Bran's flashback stuff, his visions, you know, visually, not really with a lot of dialogue. And we're, the audience is just not primed to know who Rhaegar Targaryen is. Right. Just for, purely for the visuals. We're just not. Lyanna, barely, because Ned's there and it's been built up a little bit in season six so far. But in terms of who Rhaegar is and why that's a big deal, I think the audience did just need to be told that because he's he's barely mentioned throughout the show. He comes up, I mean, they try. You know, have Barristan mentioned him before his death. He comes up. But the book audience knows exactly who Rhaegar Targaryen is, and the show audience not so much. So I think the the second part of that revelation need to just be said. Yeah, I, I think that's that's absolutely correct. Although I did I didn't think they did a fantastic job in like showing like the the wedding scene between Lyanna and Rhaegar. That uh, wig, that was, yeah, as everyone the, the, said, it's true. The wig, the wig, the wig scene. <sighs> Catelyn K asks, George's plans never seem to come to fruition if they are fully laid out on page. How do you think Littlefinger's plan in the Veil to marry Sansa will go wrong with Harry the heir? That's a good question. That's something uh, Chloe over at Girls Canon has written a ton about. What do you think is going to go there? Well, I mean, we have a confluence of several major characters that have shown up at the turning of the hand or have shown up at, in the Veil by Sansa's final chapter in A Feast for Crows. Uh, the major one being the Mad Mouse. Sure. We also have the hanging plot line of the wildling clans that are up in the mountains, the, the mountain clansmen, which are likely going to play a role in upsetting the apple cart. They've been strangely silent since the end of A Storm of Swords, where they're only mentioned briefly in one of Arya's chapters as kind of being all really well armed. And you just kind of, it seems like a, a Chekhov's gun that George is going to be firing here relatively yes. soon um, with the Sansa second chapter likely being the, in my opinion, likely being the arrival of the mountain clans. We know from the Elaine sample chapter that a lot of the knights that would be normally manning the bloody gates are now up at the tourney and are mm -hmm. trying to become a part of the, uh, the winged knights, so to speak. Uh, so I could see that being kind of undermanning the, uh, the get the, the bloody, the bloody gate and that being the way that the mountain clans were able to get into the veil and then to attack the tourney itself. Do you, do you, I, I don't remember what I was talking about. Do you remember where the tourney is being held? Is it being held in the Erie or is it, I think elsewhere. it's being held at the gate to the moon, right? Because they can't go back up to the Erie now. Oh, right, they, right, right. They're, they're closing its doors for, for autumn and winter. So presumably it's being held in and around the gates of the moon. But uh, but yeah, as you say, the veil is, is loaded with these these guns waiting to go off. You've got the Mad Mouse, I think, will clearly attempt to kidnap Sansa at some point. There are theories that he's going to succeed, get her down to King's Landing, that she'll be part of the Varus Young Griff stuff. I don't believe that uh, okay. that side of the fandom. I think more likely that he tries and fails but in the process exposes her identity because that still has to come out. And right. I think maybe that's how it happens because like, you know, oh, he's not trying to just kidnap Littlefinger's random daughter. No, she must be someone important. Mm -hmm. So that's when I think maybe it comes out that she's Sansa Stark. In terms of disrupting like the overall big picture of Littlefinger's plan or at least shifting it northward in a hurry. Yeah, I think that's probably what the mountain clans are for. Especially when you give up like little fingers, like like hoarding food, right? <laughs> As we see in, in Sansa's released winds chapter, the the clansmen might have words to say about that. And you have all the knights <laughs> in one place. Yeah, it definitely seems like George is is lining us up for that. Yeah, it's it's definitely a plot point that I'm looking forward to in the in the winds of winter. Me, I'm looking forward to uh, a Sansa plot in the winds of winter. What can I say? What a concept! What a concept! <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Clint, who is not a spy, asks, which of Jamie's oaths do you think he did a better job at upholding, and which do you think he failed at upholding? 
Hmm. Well, I mean, the Kingsguard vow is kind of in shambles. <laughs> you don't say. Because he killed him. <laughs> But he, you know, in doing so, he upheld his night vows, his nightly vows. So I would say his nightly vows are in better shape. Although the whole pushing Bren out the window thing kind of also throws those. But you know, as Jamie himself tries to express, you know, it's, it's human honor is not like it's not it's not like a hymen where you just break it and just like oh it's all gone forever. Like you know, it's a little more complex than that. So I would say his knighthood vows are in better state than his Kingsguard vows, which is good because I think his knighthood vows are more important. What do you think? I agreed. I, I think he's supposed to uphold and protect the the weak and the and the innocent and he demonstrates that with his conduct with to brienne in, in a storm of swords um now <laughs> protecting the innocent and the weak is something that he fails to uphold when we get to back to river run the scene from a feast of crows we were early referencing where he of course threatens to throw Edmure's unborn child over a uh the walls of river run, or against the walls of river run sure. in a trebuchet so I don't know, threatens does he do it would he have done it who's you know who knows but he's definitely pushing the pushing the envelope there for sure you were talking about that on twitter today right about the uh whether he would have or not and i think you came to the side that if ed had said no he would have right I, I mean you know i think he would have felt the need to i mean i don't know Tyrion doesn't actually you know he's not in the position to carry out what he threatens against tommen but he thinks to himself when he, he thinks he still might have to. It's like, oh, I have to. I said I did. So maybe Jamie would be pushed by that. Mm. Yeah, I think that's probably tr accurate. <clears throat> um, SKNCS, is Sander going to just stay at the Quiet Isle and live in peace? Or is he going to come back into the story? If so, what would be the impetus for him doing so? I think he's definitely going to come back into the story. Um, the impetus... You know, I can certainly see the Quiet Isle being threatened. I don't think it's going to... I don't really like the kind of blunt, obvious irony that it, how it played out in the show, where it's like, let's have a speech about peace. Immediately war shows up. You know, a <laughs> little, little too on the nose. But I can see something threatening the Quiet Isle, or, you know, a lot of people, you know, maybe he just gets news about war outside from, like, Septon Maribald passes through. He gets news about Arya or the Brotherhood. Maybe the Wolf Pack is somehow involved. A lot of potential triggers there, I think. But, yeah, you know, I can see the Quiet Isle coming under attack, too, unfortunately. It might also maybe I'm, I'm not remembering the uh, the geography correctly, but can you get to the Quiet Isle from the Western Sea? Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Could the Ironborn come up the based on what I'm asking? If the Ironborn could come up and, and attack the Quiet Isle or something like that, I think there's been a theory that's been kind of tossed around that way. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean that could, that could be a way that we get center back in the story. But I could, I could also see him too. It being like revealed far and wide that ah Sansa Stark is actually alive and she's in the veil. She's been posing mm -hmm. as Elaine this entire time, and Sanders like fuck this I'm out of here, <laughs> and he goes, "I gotta get that white cloak right. back." Yeah, that 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 might be the best uh, possibility, actually. Right, that's yeah, the one that would right. be that would be that would be uh, less of the uh, the older brother dying, which would be bad, very sad. Guilty Undertaker asks, any thoughts on how Ed Beer compares contrast here to Emery Florent? Uh, I don't think Edmure actually d compares that well to Emery Florent because Emery, Emery, Emery Florent was kind of a total fucking moron when it came to like everything. Um, <laughs> sure. Sailing the fleet into Blackwater Bay without sending out scouts, not securing the winch towers that are guarding the entrance to and out of Blackwater Bay. And of course, not listening to reason and taking his sweet ass time to get up to Blackwater Bay, things that Davos points out in his third chapter in a clash of Kings. So uh, Edmir is more like he, it's actually Edmir wins this battle. I think that's something that might kind of fall by the wayside because we know sure, the outcome. Sure. Cause that, immediately gets overwhelmed by the war, but no, right. he does win. He defeats Tywin. Emery very much loses the battle of the Blackwater loses, absolutely loses his side of the battle of the Blackwater. And it's only by happenstance that Stannis is able to almost salvage a victory out of Emery Tully, uh, Emery Tully, Emery Florence shameful behavior on the sea, on the high seas. That's my opinion anyways. Yeah. I think, you know, Edmure might be lost in his own head a little bit, but he, uh, you know, he's well-intentioned. He executes competent tactics. Emery feels it like every stage of leadership as we'll get to in, in Davos's last chapter in the clash of Kings whether in terms of the larger picture, in terms of how he handles individual boats within his fleet, in terms of how he thinks about Joffrey's fleet, how he handles Davos's criticism, like every single level of leadership 
every test Emery Florent flails, fails and flails. Fails and fails, um, yeah. And, you know, because the Florence as a whole are just, you know, I think a much a much more negative take on leadership than Edmure, because Edmure, I think, is, is more complicated. You get a sense, like, Edmure has the best of intentions, but just the way power dynamics have worked out is just leading him to bad decisions. But the Florence is like, fuck these people <laughs> as a group and as individuals. Get them as far away from other human beings as we possibly can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Frank B., Go get back to studying. Frank it says, "What's your favorite fan cast head canon? Mads Mikkelsen as Euron, John John Mulaney as Pylos, Kevin McKidd as Garland. <laughs> Kevin McKidd as Garland. That's an interesting one. I've heard Kevin McKidd as John Connington before okay. too. Uh, I think that would be a fine one. Yeah, Mads as Euron is my number one. Just Mads is you know Han- Mads Mikkelsen circa Hannibal is just just too perfect for the." the serial killer you're on aspect. I'm also a big fan of Michael Shannon as Stannis, although I think Stephen Delaney did a great job too, but Michael Shannon with his, just kind of his ferocity and the way his brittle voice, I think would just, would just be perfect. What about you, sir? Weren't you, I'm sorry. Weren't you saying one, like didn't when we were just before we started recording, what was the one you were saying? What was, uh, Oh, uh, right. What was, what was I? Um, Oh yes. Um, what's, what's, what's her actual, uh, what's the actress's name? Oh, yeah, it's, uh, Rosalind, uh, Rosalind Frey. Um, Mary McDonnell, Rosalind from Battlestar Galactica. She's been in a couple other things. I was thinking of her as Catalan. Mm. That, that would be wonderful. I just like her as an actress a lot, though, too. So I'm she's great. In that case. And she's like, can, be, can bring the steel, too, as we saw in some of the later seasons of Battlestar Galactica. Oh, for sure. One of my favorite Battlestar moments is there's the subplot when the, the, the hard ass, like crazy fascist admiral shows up. Yes. Her battle star, and they like get into a dispute immediately, and it's barely resolved. And then afterwards, Admiral Adama and Laura Rosalind are just sitting there exhausted. And Rosalind's not even looking at Adama. She's just sitting very casually, and she just says, You know, we're going to have to kill her. <laughs> and she just <laughs> says it. And it's just so wonderful. Mm. I, I, you're making me want to rewatch Battle Star. I, I got like into like. The best still. The, I did like the first, I did the miniseries in the first episode, and then I was like, Oh, I'm definitely going to like keep up with this. And then I didn't. Sadly, that's the case for a lot of things. But yeah, I definitely uh, can see your uh, Ray Stevenson's Victorian is is one that I, I like a yeah, lot. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, just kind of this big British dude who can, uh, you know, chew scenery and also be really dumb, which is a uh, great, uh, so good. SKNCS, do you think that George will reveal anything that makes Rhaegar's actions seem less dumb and immoral, or is that the point? What do you think, sir? Um. I think the the one thing that I could see that would make Rhaegar seem less dumb and immoral would be, and this is referenced in in one of Jamie's chapters in a feast. Was it Jamie's chapters in a feast for crows or one of the chapters in a song of ice and fire about how Rhaegar had read all the the books about prophecy and things like that, and that had mm-hmm. led him to decide to become a knight. And now it's Bar- Barrison says it's in Danny's first chapter in Storm of Swords. I think if we find out that Rhaegar had heard all of these prophecies about ending, about the coming of the others and the White Walkers and his belief that he had to bear children that would forestall the prophecy, I think that would make him more understandable. I think it would be still put him uh, a bit immoral and uh, seem kind of dumb in the way that he went about fulfilling these prophecies. And it would also lead to this thing aspect too of like, Rhaegar's attempt to fulfill the prophecies led to his death, which seems to be this thing that George does with prophecies that they have these unintended consequences, which end up biting the people who are attempting to make these prophecies into reality, uh, right in the ass. Yeah. It's, it's, it's difficult for me to say, because I think Rhaegar is just, is clearly overwhelmed with the imagery of tragedy and loss and grief and prophetic awareness and doom and all that good stuff. And, Clearly, all of that was point was 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 guiding his actions towards what he thought was inevitable and perhaps also right. There are little slippages around the edges with Rhaegar, which makes which make me wonder whether he was really convinced of that or was just didn't see any other prospects to his life and seized on this as an easy way to solve intractable problems. Because I'm always haunted by what he says to Jamie and Feast that you know I should have called a council earlier, but ah well. Like, if you're, everything you're doing is being dictated by prophecy, why do you think you had a choice? Why do you think you should have mm-hmm. done something differently? Aren't you, isn't every step of this being guided? So that seems to be Rhaegar admitting that this is in his, in his control. And, I mean, for, for me, the one sticking point with Rhaegar is always, 
how could you have left your dad in charge for yeah. months? Well, not telling anyone what you were doing, not even communicating anything. And there were theories that, you know, there was attempts at communication or they were lost or taken, you know, taken away by people who had their own unscrupulous agendas. And that's all possible. But the sense we get of Rhaegar so strongly is that he had, you know, certain blind spots in his path. And I think he either just didn't know what was going to happen with Harris or didn't care or just thought it inevitable. But that, for me, the, the only context that, it doesn't even explain it really, just that, that, that Rayor had come to a conclusion that things like leaving his dad in charge didn't matter anymore. Hmm. And I think that level of awareness is terrifying to contemplate, and I don't know that it's a good thing. I agree. I mean, that is like, I, I think beyond the abducting or absconding with Liana, most likely absconding with Liana, beyond really setting Westeros on fire by, <clears throat> you know, pinning the rose, so to speak, on, on Lyanna at the Tourney of Heron Hall. Leaving Eris in charge was just the worst possible decision that, that Rhaegar could have made. And I think it, it does speak to something that's really kind of, yeah, I think like you put it really well, terrifying that you think that that's kind of small potatoes against like the overall scheme of things, right? Yeah, it's not even that I like hate him for to go, ooh, Rhaegar, you've really screwed up. It's more just like, wow, that was your mindset. I just can't relate to that. There's so much more I'd have to know that maybe you knew, Rhaegar, to even get to where you are. And like that, you know, it's not nearly as bad as his father, but there's something kind of off about that too, in terms of being in charge of everything with that kind of mindset, that kind of tunnel vision. I'm like, for the same reason I have hesitations about Stannis a lot of the time. It's like you you're a little too convinced of your own correctness there, right. sir. That's going to lead you into trouble. I agree. Mick Mick asks, Jeff, you've hinted at your Christian faith a few times. Have you ever read the Chronicles of Narnia? And are you a fan of C.S. Lewis's nonfiction writings? He also says, I only saw the first film as a kid, but never knew until many years later that the book series it's based on means a lot to Christians that fascinated me and made me read them. I didn't heart nor hate the books, but love discussing its themes with my Christian friend. I grew up Catholic myself, but I'm not very religious. Would love to see a faithful adaptation. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I've more than hinted that I've, <laughs> I have my Christian faith. I, I am, I am a, a Christian, uh, an Xtian as, as the, as the cool kids are saying these days on Twitter, they're not saying that. Um, I have read several CS Lewis books. Um, the, the two that I recommend are, are mere Christianity. Uh, for those of you who want to, the breakdown of the Christian faith that it's, it's basic core levels, but I, the one I love the most is the, the, the screw tape letters, which is his letters hmm. of. Screwtape, who is a, a demon who is writing reports back to uh, the elder, I can't remember now, it's been years, to the elder demon in which he talks about the, the nature of, of mankind, humanity, and what it means to uh, to sin and to to be involved in in, in that world. Uh, I think those are two books that are, that are worth reading. Screwtape Letters probably being the one that would probably appeal to the more literary-minded, uh, Mere Christianity being the one that would appeal to people who are interested in, in the basic principles and tenets of the Christian faith. Uh, Lewis attempted to do a very broad thing that <laughs> papered over a lot of like theological disputes that are inherent in Christianity, but it, it, it's it's worth it's worth a read at the, at the very least. Um, I find him to be a good writer. I did read the Chronicles of Narnia when I was a kid. Um, I, I do plan to read the Chronicles of Narnia to my daughters when they if they want to. Then we want to read them a little bit older. When they get a little bit older. Uh, since I'm reading Lord of the Rings to my uh, my, my youngest daughter before she falls asleep some nights, so. I figure I have to give her a little bit of Chronicles of Narnia as well at some point down the road. I haven't read the Chronicles of Narnia in a long time. I remember really enjoying them when I read them as kids. I read them in college, I think, and I remember enjoying them then. But it's it's been a bit. I could see myself definitely enjoying them. I remember definitely, you know, the the, the Christian aspects of it work because they're they're about creating a feeling in you, not just, you know, mm -hmm. speaking to you in a language they assume you understand or try, trying to not even sure. Mm -hmm. Not even sure up the values. It's just the the weight of the oceanic feeling you have for Aslan is just really intense, and it's trying to get that across. I think it does a great job. I love the screw tape letters. Uh, I, that's another one I have not read in years, but should. I remember really enjoying that. I love that. Um, I remember Bill Watterson, the guy who draws Calvin and Hobbes, says that he named uh, uh, Calvin's snappish teacher Wormwood, Mrs. Wormwood, after Wormwood. Wormwood yeah, that's the elder, right? In screw tape letters. Yeah. Um. So yeah, that's a uh, that's the. I definitely recommend that as well. I love that book. Yeah, I, I I agree, and and you know the movie adaptation is is not bad necessarily. Oh right, they did that, didn't they? 
I mean, the first one's pretty good. I mean, I, I saw that in theaters, right? The, the first one is 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 unusually not bad for for right? for a, a, a YA movie trying to capitalize on the Lord of the Rings uh, hoopla, which it very clearly is. Uh, but no, it's actually pretty well done. I yeah, agree. The, the music is really good too. I have it on. Yes, I don't know if you guys uh, is it Harry Gregson Williams or something like that. I can't remember. It's the exact composer. I don't either, but yeah, no, that's, that's definitely worth a rewatch. All really good stuff. All right. Um... If you guys do have questions, feel free to repost them because I, I can only scroll. I think I've said everything every single episode. I can only scroll, scroll so far up uh, using the uh, the app that we're using for this uh, recording. I did actually watch Guilty Under Take Outs. The BBC Narnia adaptations were good, but very low budget. I did watch those. Those are actually really, really good. Uh, do recommend if you guys have not seen them. Have you seen that the, the BBC adaptation? I have not. No, I should. They're good. They're, they're good for, for kids and stuff like that, too. So. Harry Gregson Williams, yes, as Lewis says, and he is going yes. uh, to bed now. So good night, Lewis, and thanks for uh, joining us again, man. Hope you're feeling better. Caitlin asks, is there any scenario where Bruce stayed loyal to Rob? Oh, yeah. Uh, I think George has talked about this before, right? Like the Bruce was trying to keep a foot in each camp as long as he possibly could. Right. It was only after the Blackwater that he decided to... Um, actually legitimately turn like he, he's making a number of moves beforehand as we talked about before and having ramsey marry lady hornwood and do things that mm -hmm. undercut the oh, starks yeah. but they're advancing bold interests but they're not like directly like uh betraying the, the starks for for the lannisters that only comes after the battle of the blackwater and after Roose makes the calculation that the stark cause is essentially lost so they're yeah he, he could have jumped back to the stark cause and stayed loyal to rob if Stannis had won at the Battle of the Blackwater. Yeah, it's it's you know, it's easy in hindsight to make it seem like Rob's defeat was inevitable. But remember, the Starks are winning the war mm -hmm. up until the Battle of Blackwater. Roos has no reason to turn because you know, Roos is a very, very cruel man and does not see other human beings as human beings. But he has he doesn't he doesn't do stuff just for the evils of it. Like he has a political calculation at work. And up until the Blackwater, he he is better off doing his horrible stuff under Rob's banner than outside than just stepping outside the tent. Because you know, Roos, it's a real risk Roos takes on teaming up mm -hmm. with the Lannisters instead. Like that, that is is putting your neck out there politically, even doing it the kind of shadowy halfway way he does it. So it, it, it took a lot to to move him over the line. But yeah, after the Blackwater, when really when he sends uh, Hellman, Tallheart, and Robert Glover to Duskendale. <laughs> To get their asses kicked, that that <laughs> like that, I think is is Roos signing on the bottom line. Because if anyone survives that battle, he basically he has to kill Rob at that point. Because if anyone survives that battle and tells Ru Rob what happens, then Rob is coming for Roos. So I think that's the moment he's really committed. And you just reminded me that it's it, he commits there, but George said specifically that he was willing to jump even up to the dinner scene with Jamie Lannister and Harren Hall. So Fair the middle right. of the He's still willing to jump back to Rob's side. He's just looking for that reassurance from Jamie that he's not going to be murdered by Tywin at some point thereafter. He's not going to be held responsible also for Jamie's maiming. So th those are the, right, the factors right. there. That's true. I mean, he could, you know, if all went to shit at Heron Hall, and you know, like Jamie got killed by Virgo Hoat and like Bruce, the, like, oh God, I'm going to be blamed for this. I'm, I, I'm tainted on the Lannister side now. Roos could potentially just roll up to the twins and tell and say, Walter Frey, hey, mm, 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 off, 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 off. <laughs> and what's Walter going to do about it? Like, he can't run the Red Wedding on his own. Right. He can't wipe out Rob's army. He needs Roos. Walter can't do it. So if Roos calls the Red Wedding off, he could potentially just keep going with Rob and no one ever knows what happens. So yeah, that is brilliant on his part. Mm -hmm. Caitlin asks, what's Roos's deal in general? His plans long-term seem kind of confusing. Well, yeah, I, I mentioned that's on purpose. <laughs> um, I mean, there's there's a lot of been fan theory that's been thrown out there uh, to include stuff that I've written as that of uh, Bruce Bolton having a traditional hatred for the Starks, given the traditional Stark Bolton conflict for control of the North and Bruce's eventual desire to take on the role of being the warden of the North and. Uh, the Lord Paramount of the North as well. But Barbara, Barbara Dustin provides a really interesting explanation mm -hmm. in A Dance with Dragons to Theon, where she says, well, maybe Roos wants to become king in the North. Um, 
that is a possibility. And I think it's one that shouldn't be dismissed because some of the aspects that Roos, some of the plotting that Roos does in a dance with dragons specifically where he like, like he goes radio silent on the Lancers, like after they get North of the twins, right? We, yep. the King's Landing knows nothing about what's happening at Winterfell. Like they hear that Stannis is up North and that's it. They only hear that from their allies on in the night's watch, namely Bowen Marsh. Um, this is how they find that piece of information out. Bruce Bolton stops sending letters to the Lannisters after he gets north of, of the neck. And to me, it indicates that he might be planning betrayal against the Lannisters in, in, in the north and securing his own power base in the north as well. Because Roos has to know that his days are limited uh, because people are going to find out about the Red Wedding. If he can find a rallying, unifying cause to bring the north together under the Bolton banners, it would likely be in the form of rebellion against King's Landing. The, King's Landing that has defeated them in the War of the Five Kings, and well, but if we can't, uh, I'm, I'm not. Uh, I've always been a loyal Northman. I've never been a part of this Lannister plot that's been going on. That was all Walter Frey and all those people that tragically died at the uh, the Crofters Village. It's Roos is slippery in a lot of ways, and of course, a lot of that is deliberate on George's part. He's an opaque character, and very mysterious. You're trying to get behind his pale eyes, but some of it I think is just convenient because a lot of it just doesn't make sense. Like on the surface, like I get, yeah, what you're saying there that he's, his hands are kind of clean. He could jump back. Oh, after, you know, if the Lannisters go down and we see in the North that people hate Ramsey a lot more than they hate him, but I just can't swallow that everyone <laughs> in the North is like, oh, Roos, you somehow happen to have your army intact after the Red Wedding, even though everyone else is dead. What a coincidence. <laughs> like people have to know that he flipped, right? That in, like, if like Roos came North with like, half his army i could see the argument being Roos surrendered during the red wedding mm. and was like oh god oh god okay whatever i'm with you I'm, i've been the knee so like then they could think okay Roos is kind of a coward but he wasn't in on it he's just trying to save face but the fact that Roos has all his men doesn't that clearly give away what went down at the twins and i think this is in part just george is kind of alighting that because that's not really what he wants the plot in the north to be about in a dance with dragons he doesn't really want everyone teaming up on Roos. he wants them teaming up on ramsey so Roos has to look better by comparison i get that but it, it kind of leads into this thing where Roos is is like half perfect planner and half pure agent of chaos. Yep. Where like he's he's pulling all the strings very mysteriously and he loves playing with people. But then his attitude in dance after the Red Wedding is very much just like, whatever. I did the Red Wedding. I'm done. Like, he doesn't really seem to care about anything anymore because he like the Red Wedding in itself was what he wanted to do. And it's like, he's just like, Ramsey's going to kill all my sons. That's unfortunate. <laughs> like, you'd think he'd care a little bit more if he was actually trying to set up a Bolton dynasty that will I will be king in the north and last a thousand True. years. But he's not really doing it. So part of me thinks, like, that's just the mystery of the character. Part of me thinks, like, Roos is not actually a very grounded villain. He's just supposed to be kind of creepy and weird and fun in scenes. And he doesn't, it's, you know, it's not like Littlefinger where there's like a clear, like, ah, this is the arc of your life. Like, Roos, I think, is just, Roos is just weird. <laughs> Roos be weird. That's, that's I don't really the, think he can be explained. I think he's just weird. Yeah. And I don't think we'll get much more explanation on Roos Bolton because he is like, he could be dead by the end of A Dance with Dragons. And we, because uh, Ramsey's the one who's who sends the pink letter up to to the wall. So, which has led to some fans to think that that's actually, uh, Roos is dead at that point, which allows Ramsey to uh, send missives on behalf of the Bolton family. Exactly. Ra I mean, Ramsey is clearly, I really think clearly the final boss in Bolton terms for, I think, a number of reasons. So Roos, I think is, I, I, Roos is one of my favorites, but I I, re I love him for how he's used in scenes. I don't think the, the overall picture makes a lot of sense. And that's fine. Not, a, mm -hmm. not, not every character has to be, you know, a Catalan Stark. Not every character has to be a psychological, three-dimensional, perfect, you know, oh, sure. human being. Sometimes they're just scary. And that's yeah. fine. And which brings us to a question, which uh, we have been covering in our Fever Dream episodes. Peter C. asks, is Roos a self-reference to Fever Dream in any way sure. or just general Dracula imagery? So in Fever Dream, there is a one character that reminds me the most of Roos Bolton. And it's three, two, one. <laughs> Josh York. No, not Josh York. Damon, Damon Julian, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. The, uh, the terrible, horrible vampire that is a uh, does terrible things and um, also looks a lot like Roos Bolton, too. Long black hair, pale skin, fixation on blood, you know. Very things true. It's all true. 
that are all a part of like uh, Bruce Bolton and, and Damon Julian. So I think that George didn't recycle the character necessarily for A Song of Ice and Fire, but I think he recycled a lot of the same characteristics to create this creepy, weird ass dude. Who, of course, Bruce be weird. That's the uh, the ultimate final judgment of the Not a Cast podcast about this guy. Ramsey's the one whose actions are like explicable and like rooted yeah. in his backstory, and I, I think that's the part why he's the final boss because like. There's no catharsis, I think, to get from killing Roos because he's just going to be like, eh, I lost. No, I'm dead. You know I mean? like, there's no emotions there. Like with Ramsey, it's like, oh, he wants to win. He wants to be in charge. And he's got the chip on his shoulder and he's so hateable. Mm, that's meaningful. Roos is like, Roos is a ghost. Yeah. And plug for those of you who are our patrons or not our patrons, we are doing a chapter by chapter analysis of Fever Dream. Mm -hmm. We're actually going to be recording chapter 12 on Thursday. So. Yeah, so if you guys are interested in some of that, we've been doing something similar we've been doing for the reg regular Song of Ice and Fire books on uh, on Fever Dream and on a monthly basis. So uh, patreon.com forward slash not a cast SOF. So yeah. Check it out. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Probably take two more, I guess, and probably call it a right. night if that's all right with you. Absolutely it is. This has been a lot of fun. We have 92 people apparently are watching. There are more people watching now than we're watching at normal people time hours. What's up with that, guys? We have we have, we have a regular <laughs> not a cast. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, SKNC asks, do you think any of George's statements about the series don't make sense when compared to the text? More specifically, do you apply death of the author anywhere in A Song of Ice and Fire? It's an interesting question. What about what do you think, sir? I was hoping you would answer this one. No, I um, sure. um <laughs> well, specifically one as we talked about before where George has said little little finger is everyone's friend, and that's why like he gets by in King's Landing politics. Like I really I don't like in scenes, that's just not true. Right. No one likes Littlefinger. They 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 think they need him, and they don't think he's dangerous. But like, he's not actually a great like schmoozer, like you know, the life of the party. That's really not Littlefinger. His jokes like piss everyone off, and everyone's just a little creepy and uncomfortable around him. Like they tolerate him, but yeah, I don't. I think if that's what George is intended, I don't think that quite came through. I, I was thinking about Sue. So we, we talked this very early in the podcast about how. Theon is consistently referred to as Rob Stark's best friend in the series. Like, oh, Rob's best friend is Theon Greyjoy. Rob Stark and Theon are doing things together. But when they actually interact, they, they really don't interact like friends, really. And, and I think that's part of the dynamic that, that's going on in the story. But it does strike me as one of those elements that's just a little bit off, so to speak, that we don't see like, yeah. them as, like friends, right? They just interact as like Rob's angry at Theon for doing something stupid because theon does stupid things yeah that's just something we're told rather than shown unfortunately i think yeah <sighs> all right micah last question weird question but which westerlands houses would you two and i fit into individually micah i think that you're uh the purple unicorns of the braxes right there you go you are a member of house brax that sounds delightful right i, I mean i I, we really don't know much about the Westerlands houses. I'm having difficulty assigning much personality traits to them. I guess I would I would hang out at Fair Isle. I like islands and the ocean. That'd be nice. Yeah, Fair Isle seems okay. Um, I guess I would I would go. Uh, I don't know. The the, the Craig Hall seem okay. Uh, sure, Strong sure. Strongbore has a cool name. There you go. Uh, that's uh, there. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's probably what I would, what I would do for uh for them. But I'm a. Uh, uh, should we take one more? <laughs> we got one. Sure, sure. All right. Whoops, wrong one. Deadquake fourteen asks: Have you heard about the Worldcon accusations at George R. R. Martin? Oh yeah, I uh, I think George handled that really poorly. Uh, I haven't I haven't watched it. From everything I've read about it, it seemed like he didn't bother to learn how to pronounce people's names correctly. And was just the like just getting nostalgic for an older time of world con in which you could just pinch people's thighs and you know it's just uh you know i get why he wants to relieve his halcyon glory days these days especially but i really think he should have thought about how anyone else might have perceived that that world con is just not his little fan club and it seemed like that's really how he was acting so that's disappointing yeah i mean i i think that there is who's who, who's the author that he was he was referencing Oh right, the dude who I don't remember the dude's name that they took the John Campbell. they changed the name of the award. Yeah, right, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, not just problematic goes into like straight up. Uh, if you read some of his, just need to read his Wikipedia article entry if you really want to. But there's um, aspects of his uh, outlook which are decidedly uh, 
really fucking racist and really uh, terrible. Um, this is one of those things where I, where I, I feel like George is a a person of his generation, right? He grew up in a world con scenario where he was an outsider, right? In this greater science fiction and fantasy community. And now he is an insider on it, but he still wants to kind of be the outsider and kind of still play the roles that he played in the sixties and seventies. I mean, if you look at his world con posts, a lot of them are like, look at how much fun we had with all of the naked chicks in the jello uh, and in the, in the tub back in the day. And <laughs> I mean, I get it but I don't get it at the same time. I, I do think there is uh, an element of, of growing up and being in, if you want to be the elder statesman of an organization, then it's probably for the best that you um, perhaps not praise people that have really terrible views. And also, I don't know. I mean, the, the mispronunciation of the names, I mean, George's explanation is that he didn't get a, a pronunciation guide for a lot of the stuff, which I understand. And I accept that. I, I do think there's a failure on the world on Worldcon for not getting back to him and being like, okay, you didn't pronounce these names correctly. Here's how you actually pronounce them. Yeah, so, that has to happen. So I mean, I think there's there's multiple failures on on multiple parts, but unfortunately, I think, no, there's, yeah. I think there's nothing wrong with having nostalgia for 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 the sexy times of your youth, but I think you have you know the to 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 lament that bygone day as if you would want it back implies to a lot of people you want everything about those days back, including that a lot of people were getting shut out and treated poorly. So I don't think that I don't think that was George's intent, but I don't I don't think he thought it through clearly. And I think that's that's unprofessional. I think that was my overall takeaway from again, that's it's hard for me to stay too much definitive because I just didn't watch it. But everything I've heard suggests that he behaved unprofessionally. And I think that's really unfortunate. And I hope he commits to doing better than that. Yeah, it's a good I think it's absolutely accurate and true. All right. On that happy note, <laughs> we will Absolutely. Uh, close this out for uh, for this episode of the Lattercast Podcast. Again, thank you so much for all of you folks for sticking around and chatting with you got with you us until almost midnight here on the East Coast time. So, really appreciate everyone's input. Appreciate all of your eyeballs watching our our weekly podcast. It's uh it's great. It's very gratifying to us, and we appreciate all the questions too and discussion we saw throughout the episode and. Uh, yeah, we'll look forward to coming back next week with a Stanford for a Clash mm -hmm. King Grand Six, which is, again, just a, another really sad, tragic chapter, but also really cool because we have Bran in the in the form of his wolf for like a third of the chapter, which is really, really cool, which is probably what we're going to see from Jon Snow come come the Wind's Winter at some point. So it's going to be cool. I can't wait for, to do that. Well, thank you so much, as always, folks, for bringing your eyes and ears to us. We really appreciate it, and we can't wait to do it again next week. Yep. See you soon.